Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this digitally enabled online meeting of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth held on Monday, September 14th, 2020. I'm Mayor Todd Kasenberg, and I'll call this meeting to order. I ask the Deputy Clerk to note our starting time for the minutes as 7.01 p.m. Today's meeting is being streamed live on the Municipality of North Perth YouTube channel and will be available there after the meeting as an archived video. Anyone who is invited to speak will be recorded and their voice, image, and comments will form part of the live stream. The chair and or the clerk have the discretion and authority at any time to direct the termination or interruption of live streaming. Such direction will only be given in exceptional circumstances where deemed relevant. Circumstances may include instances where the content of debate is considered misleading, defamatory, or potentially inappropriate to be published. Thank you. Welcome to those joining us via the YouTube channel. Welcome to councillors and staff and special guests who may delegate at this meeting. Uh, we're glad you're all here. Uh, council and fellow residents and businesses of North Perth, we deserve to take pride in all of our efforts towards behavioral change that have been called for in the face of COVID-19 and the global pandemic. It increasingly feels like things are returning to their usual buzz of activity. I do want to share though, that at the last meeting of the Board of Health for Huron Perth Public Health, on which I serve, our Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Miriam Klassen, did express some growing anxiety that our precautions, our changed behavior in the face of this pandemic appear to be softening. Part of this may be confusion about what rules and guidelines currently pertain. Some of this may be due to those who object to some of the guidance some of this is due to sheer fatigue. But still there is a mechanism for immunity that affects a broad swath of our society, such as a vaccine, or until there are effective treatments that reduce the illness, including medium-term consequences and risk of death, we'll have to change our lives. We, we must remain in our changed state. We must not get lax about the things we've been asked to do. Dr. Klassen did express anxiety about the recent trend towards increasing COVID-19 case capture. And I'm sure if she looked at today's number, she wouldn't be impressed either. So I again encourage you uh, to consider the fundamentals that have been given to us on behalf of our good medical officer of health and the province of Ontario. You don't need to be out in a public place, don't be. Yes, she did reiterate that guidance. When you must be in public indoor spaces, first check to see that you are well. If you are feeling sick, stay home. If you, are in, in, or if you are in indoor public spaces, use a cloth or surgical face covering, wash your hands frequently and avoid touching your face with them and maintain two meters of distance from people not in your very narrow social bubble. The return of schools, of course, represents a new possible transmission path for young to old. The basic practices defined thus far are our best path to minimizing spread and impacts of this serious disease. I urge you to do what is kind and to be meticulous in your compliance at this time. Let's move next then to item 2.1 on our agenda pertaining to interest. For the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with our council practices, provincial legislation requires councillors with a pecuniary or financial interest in any item at the council table to declare this interest and remove him or her from discussions and voting on the item. In accordance with the recommended protocol, I invite all councillors with pecuniary interest, including those who have already declared in writing to either myself or the clerk to verbally advise the chair public session and to submit documentation to this effect in writing to the clerk. Councillors are further reminded that should a potential conflict arise during the meeting, they may so declare and act at any point in the meeting. We have a few tonight. Um, Deputy Mayor Kellum, why don't we start with you? Yes, thank you, Mayor Todd. I would like you to uh, declare pecuniary interest on uh, item number 5.4.1, uh, particular with the Perth Meadows accounts as my mother and father-in-law are tenants, and then following that, 13.1, the confirmatory bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and uh, Councillor Behrens, let's have you next. 
Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I would like to declare a conflict of pecuniary interest on the accounts 5.4.1, as I have grandchildren that attend the North Perth Finright Child and Family Center, and as well 13.1, the confirmatory bylaw. I have submitted documentation to the clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Behrens. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Hi, everyone. I need to declare a conflict on 5.2.5 and 13.1 as well. Uh, the reason for that conflict is uh, potential issues that could come from urban hens and the ability of those issues to affect my business in particular. Thank you, Councillor Duncan and uh, Councillor Andreessen. Yes, thank you. Good evening, K Mayor Kaysenberg. I will need to declare um, pecuniary interest on item 5.2.5 regarding the urban chickens in North Perth, as my husband and I are owners of a poultry farm here in North Perth. I will also need to uh, declare pecuniary interest for confirmatory bylaw 13.1. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councillors that I've missed um, that wish to declare pecuniary interest tonight? Anything? Okay, so uh, let's move on uh, to an, a brief explanation of our meeting. Uh, councillors, this is old hat to you, uh, but to those who are watching, perhaps not. So just a brief explanation about our virtual processes. I'll be systematically trying to seek consent from various councillors as movers and seconders of the various resolutions and bylaws that will be put before us tonight. To some degree, I do this alphabetically. The councillor not wish to respond to the request, or if they've declared a pecuniary interest in the request, they may say so, and I will move to the next name on the alphabetical list. Regarding speaking to our business counselors tonight, will identify themselves through our conferencing technologies chat function. The clerk is assisting me tonight in maintaining the speaker's list from that uh, source. Counselors are allowed on their turn to deliver a primary question or comment and may make one supplemental without my intervention. Uh, we will follow speaking order carefully and any counselor wishing to have a second say will have to indicate again and go to the bottom of the list the clerk is maintaining. This is a normal process in, that is consistent with Robert's rules of order. Councillors are reminded that if you're, if I believe you're not audible, I'll call you on it, I'll let you know. Um, I'll, I'll wave, I'll uh, say something. Um, if you can't be heard, uh, let me be the arbiter of that. Uh, further, we ask that everyone in the call maintain a mute state until I have called upon you for a verbal reaction and from time to time the clerk may impose a mute state if uh, someone has forgotten. Should any of your votes not show up in eScribe, I will call on you when things seem stalled to register a manual vote. At that time, take yourself off mute, answer yes or no on a motion, and then return to mute. That brings us to item 2.2 .2 on our agenda. I have uh, before me a motion for the adoption of the agenda for tonight's meeting that reads as follows, that the agenda for tonight's meeting be approved. Why don't we start with Deputy Mayor Kellum? Would you serve as a mover for that? Yes, yeah, so I'll make that motion. Thank you. And Councillor Johnston, would you serve as our seconder? Yes, I would gladly second that. Thank you. Any discussion or debate from Council at this time? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, item uh, three on our agenda, the so-called consent agenda. These items are placed on council's agenda because they're believed to be non-contentious, yet they require either council's recognition or council's action. Grouping them expedites our business. However, any councillor wishing to extract an item from the consent agenda for discussion, debate, or individual action may do so. There are eight items on our consent agenda tonight, including the minutes of our last regular council meeting, which feels like it was a month ago. Oh, no, it wasn't. Okay. Councillors, do any of you have a desire to extract any of these items for further discussion or action? Uh, Clerk Perkeltz? Okay, Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Case. We're going through you. I'd just uh, like to bring to Council's attention uh, item 3.5. It's the uh, letter from the Ministry of Ag Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, Ernie Hardiman.
Yes, um, Councillor Richardson, do you have a particular? Uh, uh, oh, comment? sorry, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to make comment on that. Um, there is also a discussion paper in there, and I don't know if it would be beneficial in strictly putting it on the floor for Council's attention is to look at that. Um, this is basically um, the uh, Security from Trespass and Protection Food Safety Act in 2020, which was passed in 2019. There are some amendments to it. Uh, possibly we could uh, put our support behind that, even though it was placed in law, but uh, they're also asking for comments and especially given the significant agricultural sector that we have uh, in Perth and North Perth uh, and Perth surrounding Perth County, possibly consulting the um, uh, Perth County Farmers Association, uh, that maybe they would be able to provide comments uh, on that. I just more or less bringing, putting it on the floor for discussion that they are seeking a little bit of input that maybe we could uh, provide some from the experts that we either have on council or from any associations that we happen to deal with. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Richardson. Uh, the clerk is pointing out to me that the discussion uh, end point uh, that the government has indicated is October 15th, uh, which gives us a little bit of lead time. Uh, perhaps uh, if um, if we might, we could, we could uh, um, consider uh, a resolution regarding Exploring this somewhat further, if you want, uh, for our, our next meeting, uh, Councillor Richardson, would that seem reasonable? Yes, I'd be happy to make that motion. Thank you. Okay, so we'll, if, if there's general consent uh, uh, from a procedural perspective, we'll add that to uh, um, uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll create a resolution for that purpose uh, uh, to consider that matter at our next council meeting. Any other items from the consent agenda that should be extracted? Councillor Rothwell. Uh, Councillor uh, Richardson raised the point I was going to raise. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. So we'll uh, we'll set we'll cue that up in the context of this. Any other um, requests with regards to the consent agenda tonight, Council? Perfect. Anything? Okay. So why don't we do this? We'll, we'll create the usual motion, and then we'll create another motion that will. Um, ask us to bring us back for a discussion and uh, action at our next meeting. So uh, at this point, we have um, a motion to receive eight items and approve previous council meeting uh, minutes. It reads as follows, that consent items 3.1 to 3.8 be received for information. And the minutes of the August 24th, 2020 regular council meeting be adopted. Uh, Councillor Richardson, can I call on you for that one as a, our mover? I will move that, thank you. And uh, gee, coincidentally, about the two guys who are speaking about 3.5, uh, Councilor Rothwell, can, will you be our seconder for this one? I'll second the motion, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Any discussion or debate on this consent agenda motion? Seeing none, let's have that vote. So that is carried. Uh, we'll introduce another motion here then, which is um, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth directs staff to bring forward a report on uh, potential input to the government's consultation process on uh, the matter related to item 3.5 of our consent agenda. Um, Councillor Siler, would you serve as mover for that? I will move that, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Andreessen, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I'll make that, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Okay, I'm just waiting to see whether uh, Deputy Clerk Beer is with us. She's, okay, and Councillor Behrens. Uh, so we have it's moved and seconded. Uh, discussion or debate, Councillor Behrens. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I think it's important that we do get comments back from the Perth County Federation of Agriculture as well as the Christian farmers. So I'm concerned about um, potentially getting it back by our next meeting. Uh, it, I would prefer it say, you know, placed on a future agenda prior to the deadline um, so that we can give this the attention that it does deserve. That's simply my comment. Makes sense. Did, did we, did, was I too narrow in, in applying a, a return date for this in the suggestion of the resolution? 
at, at an upcoming council meeting before the deadline for submission. Is that acceptable to you, Councillor Barron? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. It might be on next Monday's agenda, but um, just getting the information back from our um, agricultural federations, it might take a little bit more time than that. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. And, and I suppose in directing staff, staff will consider the advice and, and input from appropriate to stakeholders in the community, given council's interest in that. Okay. Any further discussions uh, or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that's great. Thank you very much. That allows us to uh, move on to item four on our agenda. Uh, we have a busy night indeed under section four of our agenda. Uh, first, we have uh, two public meetings to deal with land planning matters. And then we'll have, uh, when we reconvene from that, uh, three delegations to follow. To facilitate the public meetings, we must temporarily adjourn from our regular council meeting. And I have a motion before me that will uh, make that happen. That reads as follows that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth adjourns at 7.17 p.m. for the purpose of public meetings under the Planning Act concerning the following. One, a zoning bylaw amendment application by Terpster Drying Inc. And two, a zoning bylaw amendment application by Stephen Dolson, Karen Galbraith, and JAD SSD Inc. And can I call on Councillor Anstead to serve as our mover for that one? Yes, I will move that. Thank you, and Councillor Burns, will you serve as seconder? Yes, I will second that motion. Thanks. All right. Um, any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. Who are we missing? We're missing council. council. I am in favor. Thank you. So that is carried, uh, which means that we are temporarily adjourned. At this time then, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome any who have joined us for the public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act for a proposed amendment to North Perth zoning bylaw. A welcome again to all those uh, who have joined us um, and uh, should we need to hear from you, I'm sure the clerk has made appropriate arrangements for that purpose. This is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the Ontario Planning Act to deal with an application for a housekeeping amendment to the North Perth Zoning Bylaw submitted by Terpstra Drying Inc. Correspondence, reports, and comments received regarding this application will be considered by council. Uh, those in attendance uh, remotely who wish to make comment concerning this application will be given an opportunity to do so. Anyone wishing to appeal council's decision must make verbal submission to this public meeting or have made a written submission to council. Those who want to receive the notice of the municipality's decision concerning this application must notify our clerk by email or telephone giving their mailing address and telephone number. At this time, I'm going to call on North Perth planner, Sean Yilmaz, to provide an overview of this application. Thank you, uh, and good evening, Mayor Kaysenberg, members of council. The applicant on behalf of the property owner has submitted the application to amend the municipality of North Perth zoning bylaw as a condition of the County of Perth application for consent B3319 which is a surplus farm dwelling severance. The subject property is an interior lot located on the north side of Perth Line 72, just west of Perth Road 147. Uh, the property has been approved for land severance to create an individual lot of record containing, uh, excuse me, consisting of one existing single detached dwelling, which has been deemed surplus while retaining the agricultural lands consisting of farmland. The retained lands are approximately 34 point two hectares or 84.4 acres and will remain in the agricultural zone but placed in the A-62 zone 
This zone prohibits the establishment of a new residential dwelling on the property. The parcel contains farmland, a woodlot, uh, and a water course with a grain bin. The severed lands are approximately 0 0.8 hectares or 1.99 acres and will be placed in the A-1 zone. This zone limits a use to one single detached residential dwelling and accessory uses. The severed lot contains uh, an existing dwelling, an existing building, which is a shed, septic, and well. The severed lot will have approximately 67.5 meters of frontage along Perth Line 72. The proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms to the County of Perth official plan, and meets the requirements of the North Perth zoning bylaw. It is staff's recommendation that Council approve the application for a zoning bylaw amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yilmaz. At this time, I'm going to call on the clerk to give us some information both about the notice of public meeting details and about any correspondence, comments, and reports received to date. Notices inviting persons to the public meeting were mailed on August the 24th, 2020 by first class mail to landowners within 120 meters of the subject property and email to all applicable agencies. The notice was posted on the website and on the subject property on August 24th, 2020, advising of tonight's public meeting. I have not been in receipt of any correspondence regarding this proposed zoning bylaw application. Thank you, Clerk Bearfelt. Um, at this time, there's the opportunity for those who've attended the public meeting to have their say. Those who are in support of the application other than the applicant, Clerk Perfels, do we have anticipation of anyone uh, in attendance tonight who meets that criteria? Thank you, uh, that was a no. Uh, those who are in opposition to the application, has anyone come for the express attended purpose of, a, of opposing the application? Okay. And finally, uh, with regards to the applicant, is the applicant or their agent here and wish to speak? Mr. Leork. Okay, Mr. Leork, if you'd like to speak, you're welcome to do so at this time. He says no. He says no, thank you. Okay, so, uh, um, all right, we have, uh, we're moving through this. Uh, Council, do you have any comments or questions about this application at this time? Are we seeing anything in the uh, chat window at this time? Councillor Rothwell. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Uh, I believe that uh, North Perth Council uh, gave a recommendation on this application through to our county's land division committee. And if my notes and memory are correct, we'd expressed concern as did the uh, county planning department regarding the size of the parcel. And it concerns me that uh, irrespective of those two matters, our land division committee uh, did move forward and uh, grant uh, conditional approval of this consent. Uh, 1.99 acres is uh, substantial in size, but uh, the clear issue of concern uh, that was expressed, as I recall, was not just uh, the size of the parcel, but also the, I think it's a uh, 40 by 80 or uh, something of that matter, shed, which is clearly uh, far and away removed from the dwelling itself. And uh, perhaps Councillor can, Duncan can provide some information as to why uh, Land Division Committee uh, granted approval of this consent, irrespective of North Perth Council's recommendation and the County Planning Department's recommendation regarding the size of the parcel. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Duncan, uh, certainly no obligation, but if you wish to address this uh, from what you remember, or I think it might be appreciated. Yeah, sure. Uh, we, we've considered this at, I think, about three different land division committee meetings this came back to. And the f approval, the, t the time we approved this, county planning department actually uh, said yes, we should approve it. It is 1.99 acres, I realize that, and we've done them bigger and we've done them smaller. Land Division Committee considers each application and through consultation with both the applicant and his agent, this is what we did to make the application move forward. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Duncan. Uh, further, Councillor Rothwell? Uh, I appreciate the uh, comment, and uh, I, I will not be voting in favor of this application. Frankly, I don't believe that it does uh, meet the criteria as established in the county official plan. Uh, I uh, am also concerned, frankly, that uh, there is uh, a for sale sign up on this property already. I'm, I'm at the point of thinking that somehow uh, someone's either A, taking things for granted that uh, North Perth Council is simply going to amend the zoning bylaw here this evening. Uh, because the property has been uh, listed for sale for some time, uh, at least for the last uh, week or two, uh, signs have been uh, on this property. And I am uh, quite concerned uh, that uh, we're being uh, taken for granted in terms of uh, what, uh, that we're simply a rubber stamp on this. Thank you. Okay. So Councillor Behrens is next. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I uh, must admit I am slightly confused because in reading the notice of decision uh, from the County Land Division, um, comment number nine uh, or criteria number nine says that the size of the proposed severed lot will be reduced in size um, and exclude an area of land containing cultivated land um, so I'm just going to request that maybe we can get clarification from our North Perth planner to um, say, is this in fact a reduced size um, as it reads in uh, criteria number nine on the decision from Perth County, or is this uh, the full um, amount that was applied for? Okay, let me, if I may, let me turn to Councillor Duncan and invite him if he has any re recollection on this matter, uh, if you want to weigh in on your understanding. So yes, Julie, it was reduced. The original application, they had ran the property line somewhat along the hydro line and we're going to include the cultivated area that's in kind of a horseshoe shaped headed towards the laneway. And that has been removed from the application and left with the farm. But that still leaves the net property area as 1.99 acres. Is that your understanding, Councillor? Yeah, that's my understanding, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Cal uh, Planner Yilmaz, did you want to weigh in on a few of these things? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and it is a good question. Uh, so there was a reduction from what was uh, originally proposed um, and what was part of that notice of decision. Um, and as Councillor Duncan had mentioned, it was that part of the land adjacent with line 72, um, kind of going eastward, um, which has been removed. Okay, thank you. Councillor Johnston. Johnston, next. Thank you, Mayor Todd. Uh, just to comment that I uh, strongly support Councillor Rothwell's views on this, that, uh, that um, when North Perth it seems like uh, our recommendations are not being followed, and that we're being taken for granted that this property is already listed for sale and it's just very presumptive that this will be passed rubber stamped and uh, and moved on so i'm uh, very disappointed uh in the way this has come back and very disappointed that that uh, people are presuming we are just going to pass everything and they, they can put for sale signs on it before things are passed and i will not be voting in favor of it Okay, um, we do have the uh, agent of the, uh, of the proponent here. Um, Mr. Lewerk, I think there's an important question that, that council has some interest in, and uh, a few, of course, but uh, in particular, the fact that there's a for sale sign on this lot is um, somewhat concerning. And uh, I, it would be helpful for us if you would address this matter and tell us what you know about the facts on this matter. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Le York is indicating that he's having technical difficulties at his end. Um, that, that kind of stymies our ability to understand this question. Um, are, are, there, are there any other um, questions or comments from council members uh, before we close off this public meeting? 
Okay, so Mr. Leork is, is going to try to attempt to, uh, to type into the chat box uh, for council's benefit. Um, if we're prepared to uh, give him uh, the time that he will need to do that. Um, but I think we need to know uh, about that uh, for sale sign issue and whether that's real or not. Okay, so the clerk advises that Mr. Leork's uh, response to the question is that the reason for starting to market the property uh, was due to the fact that winter is approaching. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council at this point that haven't been heard? Are we seeing any indication of same? Okay, so um, let me uh, speak to the future actions. Notice of a decision will be given in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. Council's decision is subject to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. At this point, that public meeting is uh, closed, brought to an end, and now we have a second one for our consideration council. Uh, this is a public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act for a proposed amendment to the North Perth Zoning Bylaw. Again, welcome to those who've come for this particular public meeting. Our purpose, this is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the Ontario Planning Act to deal with an application for an amendment to the North Perth Zoning Bylaw submitted by Witzel Dice Engineering on behalf of Labo Lit Limited. Correspondence, reports, and comments received regarding this application will be considered by council. Those in attendance remotely wishing to make comment concerning this application will be given an opportunity to do so. Anyone wishing to appeal council's decision must make verbal submission during this public meeting or have made a written submission to the council. Those who want to receive notice of the municipality's decision concerning this application must notify the clerk by email or telephone, giving their mailing address and telephone number. This time I'm going to call on North Perth planner, Sean Yilmaz, who will give us a, a summary of this application and request for a zoning bylaw amendment. Mr. Yilmaz. Thank you. I just to confirm, um, I just wanted to know if we're discussing the, the right application. Um, I have ZBA 12 2020 by Dolson Galbraith. Um, I'm not sure if that's the same one that you mentioned, unless I misheard, and I do apologize if I did. Thank you for that, Sean. Let me just to take a pause while the clerk uh, gets us set up here. The document that I was given. It's, it's what's up here. Okay, so this is, um, I don't think this is the same one as, as uh, what is in the document that I have before me. No, this is Witzel Dice on behalf of Labolid. That's not right, is it? That's later on. So what do I do at this point? So I'm just seeking some advice. Okay, just a little bit of paperwork confusion on in my book here. Uh, so this actually is a statutory public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act, the Ontario Planning Act, to deal with an application for an amendment to the North Perth Zoning Bylaw submitted by, I'm going to look at the details here, uh, submitted by um, Steve Dolson, Karen Galbraith, and JAD SSD Inc. Uh, pertaining to properties, uh, uh, that they have uh, hold over. The other comments that I've made with regards to the purpose um, are still uh, valid and correct. And so now, sorry about that confusion, uh, Mr. Yilmaz, back to you. Thank you. Um, yes, and no problem. Uh, the property owners have submitted the application to amend the municipality of North Perth zoning bylaw, uh, similar to the last application as a condition of the County of Perth application for consent B1020, which is also a surplus farm dwelling severance. The subject property is an interior lot located on the west side of road 158, just north of line 78. The property has been approved for a land severance to create an individual lot of record. Uh, the retained lands are approximately 40 hectares or 98.8 acres and will, 
and will remain in the agricultural zone, but placed in the agricultural, excuse me, A-62 zone with a subscript three. The A-62 zone prohibits the establishment of a new residential dwelling on the property. The site-specific subscript three recognizes a def deficient setback for an existing accessory structure, uh, which is expected to remain on the farm parcel. The parcel contains farmland, a municipal drain, and an accessory building. Uh, an existing barn is also located on the retained lands, but must be removed. The severed lands are approximately 0.3 hectares, or 0.8 acres, and will be placed into the A-1 zone. This zone limits use to one single detached residential dwelling and accessory uses. The severed lot contains an existing dwelling, septic, and well. An existing accessory building on the property must be removed. The severed lot will have approximately 55.6 meters of frontage along Road 158. The proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement, conforms with the County of Perth official plan, and meets the requirements of the North Perth zoning bylaw. It is staff's recommendation that council approve the application for the zoning bylaw amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yilmaz. Um, at this time, I'm going to uh, turn to the clerk to provide us with two things, notice of public meeting details and any correspondence, comments, and reports received to date. Notices inviting persons to the public meeting were mailed on August the 24th, 2020 by first class mail to landowners within 120 meters of the subject property and emailed to all applicable agencies. The notice was posted on the municipal website and on the subject property on August 24th, 2020 advising of the public meeting. And again, I have not been in receipt of any correspondence regarding this public meeting. Thank you, Clerk Bierfeltz. Uh, at this time uh, in our process, we turn to comments from others. Uh, at first, we'd like to hear from any of those who are in support of the application other than the applicant. Clerk Bierfeltz, has anyone so declared their intention this way? No, no other participants in conflict with Julius. Okay, so we are advised, uh, Council, that uh, Councillor Johnston uh, wishes to own, uh, wishes to declare a potential pecuniary interest on this matter at this point in the meeting. So that is now noted. Thank you. Um, does anyone wish to speak in opposition to this application? So, so we're not aware of anyone who's uh, so declared. And uh, the applicant or the applicant's agent may speak. Do we have anyone in attendance representing either, either of those parties? Bearfelt, anything? Okay. Is there anyone here representing the applicant or the applicant, uh, or, or is the applicant or representing the applicant? Okay, so we're, we're, we're advised that no one has so uh, registered in advance. At this point, um, we'll turn to comments and questions from council members. Uh, should you have any council, please uh, let Clerk Bearfelds know and uh, we'll put you on the speaking list. Councillor Behrens first. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I It's a quick comment. On page 68 of our agenda, there is an explanatory note for this bylaw and it speaks to this property being in both Wallace Ward and Alma Ward, um, just for paperwork and and to make sure we uh, cross our T's and dot our I's, if that could be amended to say the Alma Ward, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Clerk Bearfelt is uh, confirming that she will attend to that. Any other comments or questions from members of council on this matter? Okay, seeing none, um, just uh, sort of what happens next and uh, all should know that notice of the decision of council will be given in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. Council's decision is subject to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act. And with that, we bring that public meeting to a close and uh, council we now ask for consideration to return to uh, our Council, regular council meeting, which uh, means we need a motion to adjourn these planning meetings. A motion for our consideration is as follows, that 
of public meetings for the purpose of Planning Act applications is now adjourned at uh, 7.40 p.m. and the council reconvened into regular open council. I'm gonna call on Councillor Johnston. Will you serve as our mover for that? Yes, I will. And uh, Councillor uh, Richardson. I'll second that. Thank you. Any uh, discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. So that is carried, thank you. And uh, next, I think we turn to the book and we see what, uh, what business we have with regards to those two public meetings. So for item 4.1, we do have uh, two items for our consideration council. Uh, the first is a regular resolution, the second a bylaw uh, pertaining to that matter. And uh, first I'll introduce the uh, proposed text of the uh, resolution that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth approved the application for a zoning bylaw amendment affecting property described as part of Lot 28, Concession 9, 5400 Perth Line 72 in the Elma Ward of the Municipality of North Perth. The proposal is consistent with the Provincial Policy Statement 2020, conforms to the policies of the County of Perth official plan and meets the provisions of the North Perth zoning bylaw. Can I call on Councillor Duncan to serve as our mover for this one? Yes, I will move that. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor Callum, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I will second that motion. Thank you. All right, uh, discussion and debate. So we, we heard a little bit from you during our public meeting, Councillors. Uh, more to be said here. else do we have any indication, uh, expression of interest? Um, I, I do find myself uh, concerned, uh, as uh, was um, Councillor Rothwell, uh, with this notion that there is a for sale sign on the property. I think it's presumptive, and uh, I believe that um, it, it, it sends a somewhat um, insulting message to Council that uh, we're just going to represent these matters. Um, I am not happy with that outcome uh, and uh, think that it needs more care on the part of all of those who propose uh, uh, amendments and actions related to land planning in North Perth. Fairfields? Councillor Behrens, next. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I do share concerns with Councillor Rothwell and Councillor Johnson on this one. I do not think it conforms to the Perth County um, official plan for references. So I know that in the past, we have been uh, very strict on the amount of land and buildings that go with a severance, and I personally cannot support this particular um, severance since it includes an exceptionally large shed and it includes an, a large piece of property. Thank you. Okay, we're not seeing any other uh... Any other indications of uh, the willingness to speak at this point or ask a discussion or debate? Um, so I guess we should call this vote. Let's have the vote. So that, that matter is defeated. Um, let me just confer with the clerk briefly for one moment um, before we take our next action with regards to procedure. So everyone just hold on for a moment. So, so councillors, uh, you may recall at a recent meeting um, with regards to a procedural matter, um, we did not take action on the proposed bylaw and it was appropriate that we did from a procedural perspective. So this evening, the clerk advises that we should consider the bylaw and councillors may vote as uh, appropriate on this bylaw as well. Uh, so I have a bylaw pertaining to this matter for 4.1 on the agenda. Bylaw number 127-2020 being a bylaw to amend the North Perth zoning bylaw number 6-ZB-1999 as amended be introduced, read, and considered read a first, second, and third time, and be finally passed 
and that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Now I need to figure out who's gonna move and second this. Maybe you can give me some information from the last vote to Councillor Beer, or uh, you're a councillor now, I just promoted you. A uh, Deputy Clerk Beer. Okay, councillor Duncan, would you serve as our mover for this one? Yes, I'll move it. Thank you. And uh, Deputy Mayor Callum, would you serve as our seconder for this one? Yes, I will second that motion. All right, thank you. <clears throat> a little unusual, but um, we're just trying to make it work and move this along. Any discussion or debate on this bylaw proposal? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is defeated as well. All right, next up then is item 4.2. The council, uh, this one is about um, the second matter uh, that we consider tonight, the uh, Galbraith uh, JAD SSD matter. And I have again, two items for consideration. The first is a uh, resolution of council and the second is a bylaw resolution. The, the, the first resolution reads as follows that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth approve the application for a zoning bylaw amendment affecting property described as part lots 19 and 20, concession 5, 7582 road 158 in the Elma Ward. Is that, is that the, that's what we want in the Elma Ward? Thank you. Uh, the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement 2020, conforms to the policies of the County of Perth official plan and meets the provisions of the North Perth zoning bylaw. Can I call on Councillor Richardson to be our mover for this one? I will move that, thank you. Thanks, and uh, Councillor Rothwell, would you serve as a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you. All right, discussion and debate, Council. Please indicate if you have interest in participating to the clerk. If we're seeing none, so let's have that vote. Yes. Mr. Johnston is not uh, voting for declaration. So that is carried, thank you. And now I have a uh, bylaw a resolution for our consideration uh, that bylaw number 128-2020 being a bylaw to amend the North Perth zoning bylaw number 6-ZB-1999 as amended be introduced, read and considered read a first, second and third time and be finally passed. And that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Can I call on Councillor Seiler to be our mover for this one? Yes, I'll move that. Thank you. And Councillor Andreessen, would you be your seconder for this one? Yes, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried as well. Thank you. So uh, that brings us to the end of business related to public meetings from tonight's meeting. Uh, now we have three delegates council. Uh, the first, uh, my pleasure to introduce Gwyneth Woods from the Salvation Army List Wolf, who is the uh, community and family services manager for that organization. And I believe Gwyneth is with us to tell us a little bit about a very special survey that's happening in our community and hopefully bits and pieces of other good things related to the Salvation Army's work. Gwyneth, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you this evening. I wanna check, make sure everybody can hear me before I continue. Yeah, I see a couple of nods there. Um, <clears throat> I know you have a very full agenda tonight, so I'm gonna keep it brief and hopefully informative for your sake. Uh, each of you will have received or be receiving a full report on what it is that we do in this community. And I encourage you to read it and to ask any questions that you might have. Um, you're always welcome to email me or call or even to pop into the office here. We can put masks on, I can give you um, a tour as well. Tonight, I'm hoping to give you a very brief virtual tour 
to highlight a little bit of the info and encourage you again to learn some more. So, um, um, Pat, if you have that video, is it possible for you to share that? It is a little bit grainy, but it'll give you an idea of our facility. The clerk is working on queuing this up for us. Good evening, everybody. I know that Mayor Todd has had the opportunity to be in the building here, but I'll I just give her a minute there. And if it doesn't work, then I can kind of give a brief one here. And it's going to be quick, but we'll have time for questions afterwards. So this is our facility, 326 Main Street East in Listowel. And I'm going to actually get, we're going to turn oh. around here. I see me, I just don't hear me. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I know that Mayor Todd has had the opportunity to be in the building here, but I thought since we're doing virtual... You meetings, may have to... I'll narrate for you. So this is our facility. We are at 326 Main Street East. And um, <clears throat> it's it's a great facility. I'm just going to, so you'll see me see coming around the corner here. here. Um, these are our, sorting our sorting area. shelves. So we are actually affiliated with Food Bank of Canada, as well as Feed Ontario. Any of the items that come into the building are sorted on the table that you see there are volunteers. Uh, there's some according to type, they check them for expiry dates and all of those good things so that we can operate in a first in, first out um, scenario so that we're keeping things as, as fresh as possible and, uh, and taking care of the people that we serve. Up top there, you're going to see a lot of boxes. I would note that the ones at the top are actually all empty. Um, but you can see me pointing to the section here. We sort according to type. So while you'll see many boxes in the warehouse area, each item only has a few or so, depending on the item. Um, most of what we get comes in between September and December. And so usually about this time of year, we are running low on a number of those items. So hopefully despite all that's going on, we will see that kind of increase again come um, October and, and into Thanksgiving. Down this side, you'll see a little bit more storage. The items on the floor are actually from our backpack distribution we're just finishing up. We've distributed over 100 backpacks this year. And you can see me pointing a little further. We do diapers, personal hygiene items as well. And then on the opposite side, we actually have toys. Uh, for Christmas time, we do some storage from year to year. And again, those items that are sorted according to type for food. And then I think I'm going to walk a little bit further up here. Freezer sections here. Our and you can see bread, we do a freezer space meat, there as well. We do uh, bread, Bank meat, Canada, and then a variance of items stuff. through Food Banks Canada. Um, right now it's deli meat, other times it might be lasagna. This area I'm in here is what we call our pantry space. Pre COVID, we actually invited people into this space. This meant that there was some dignity of choice. And most of all, it, it gave us the opportunity to build relationship with the people that we serve. It meant that we could refer them to different places and we could take the time to kind of understand who they were, what they needed and how we could best help. Uh, during COVID, in the beginning, we actually had to pre-pack our hampers to make sure that everyone was safe. But you can see there, we've installed, it's actually a shower curtain, but we've installed a barrier there so that we can again allow them to see what's there and allow some dignity of choice there and take it out into the waiting room. Now you'll see here we have a, a large shelf. The shelf is um, is food product and we have a fridge in that area as well. Uh, Pre-COVID, that was a space where people, if they did not feel comfortable registering, were more than welcome to come in and still access food and produce. Um, Right now, it's suspended temporarily because of traffic flow as much as anything. Our space is quite limited in that area, and so we needed to make sure we didn't have kind of, you know, 10 people in that waiting area at once. Uh, we are working to change that over. We are hoping to have a housing worker in there for drop-in once a week. Um, in middle to late October. And so in order to facilitate that, we're going to have to use a smaller refrigerator in that space, a smaller shelf, but hopefully use it again. And I'm just drawing your attention to something really special here on the wall. You'll just see a cork board full of post-its. But to us, it's a little bit more than that. What this is is an opportunity for the people that we serve to put down on that wall what it is that they bring to our community. So on there, you you would see things like I'm a good listener, or I fix things, or or I'm I'm kind, and we, what we want to do is to encourage the people that we serve. We, we all know that they are in need. We all know that there's things that we can help with, but what we need to remember is that they have things to offer as well and that they have value in and of themselves. And so that's what this wall is about. It's really special to us. And, 
and hopefully again we'll be able to encourage people to participate in that and i just think i'm just finishing up there and we'll be able to continue on let that play out thanks everybody So that gives you an idea of where we operate and we are incredibly grateful for the facility but find we are quickly outgrowing it and we'll soon be on the lookout for something with a little bit more wiggle room for us. In the documents that you receive, there's a full description of our program. So I'm not going to do that to you tonight. I won't go through each and every one, but I do wanna highlight the fact that there are three basic categories for those programs. The first is what I would call long-standing programs and these programs include things like our food bank which has operated for literally decades in north perth as well as christmas distribution and our backpack distribution which i mentioned these are our core programs and they're at the very center of what we do they serve those that are financially disadvantaged within our local community and while we do request financial and personal information they seldom require documentation they tend instead to err on the side of compassion and trust. The second set of programs is what I might call application programs. And these programs are normally funded by other groups. They require not only personal info, but careful documentation and financial qualification. So these would include things like low income energy assistance applications or North Perth Sports for Kids applications as well. And the last group of programs is what I would call community programs. And these programs aim to involve the whole community. So they may be educational or intentionally community building, but at their core, they aim to remove barriers and empower participants. So this group would include cooking classes, Tomato Tuesdays, which is our online tomato growing group, sponsorships of things like mental health first aid, or the Kairos Blanket Indigenous Awareness Experience. We believe that in balancing each of these types of approaches, we're better able to fulfill our mission, which is to give hope today through service, dignity, and also proper stewardship. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the poster that uh, was discussed about the, put up there on my screen, about the survey. I think you'll have this in your package as well. And I know that most of you have seen it because it's been on the North Perth Facebook page. Um, we've partnered with these groups on this survey because as we move forward, yes, through COVID, but in general as an organization in this community, it's important to us to take what has been entrusted to us and continue to invest it in this community in the most useful way possible. So we hope that the survey will give us some insight into where individuals in North Perth are and what their future needs might be. We hope to share that with you and with other sort of supportive groups in North Perth so that we might affect change together. So if you haven't taken the survey personally, I would ask that you do and to share it with others as well, because the more documentation we have of the town as a whole, the better off we are. And before I leave space for questions, I want to encourage you to take the time to read through those documents, as I suggested, and again, to just any questions you have, any thoughts that you have, please feel free to ask. My purpose in being here tonight is not as a fundraiser or to request assistance from the municipality, at least not right now. Instead, my purpose is for you to understand that the type of work we're doing, or to understand the type of work we're doing, and to see that it is our desire to be a part of this community and its betterment, and to see us as an ally when it comes to serving vulnerable in individuals in North Perth. Our team here is growing both with volunteers and employees, and we're excited to use that to see people in our community move forward. So any questions that you might have about what we do and who we serve, or perhaps the stats that were sent through to you, I would welcome you to ask them as well at this time. Thanks, Gwyneth. Uh, Councillors, do you have any questions, uh, comments, or uh, encouragements for Gwyneth? Councillor Richardson? Um, thank you. Through your uh, Mayor Kaysenberg, I would just like to thank Gwyneth for uh, coming forward and giving a very good presentation like this, and I certainly would like to extend 
on behalf of council and all of the residents uh, of North Perth, uh, just for the fantastic work that the Salvation Army does in so many different aspects of uh, all of our lives. Uh, kudos to you, and uh, we're certainly much better for it. We would like to obviously see less people using the, obviously the services that we're discussing here, but um, uh, the times are certainly indicative of uh, certain global events that we have going on. But I just wanted to extend my thanks to you and uh, gratitude to you for being a part of our community and uh, doing such a great job all year long. Thank you. Uh, Gwyneth, just a question for me. Do you anticipate uh, stress on your uh, food and, and other consumables availability this fall as a result of the pandemic period? Yeah, I think that's the question that's at the forefront of everyone's mind, especially, um, I mean, in food banks in general, you see it in the media and that sort of thing. I will be honest that um, not just ourselves, but across the board, I think with food banks, what I've heard is that people have seen this kind of um, almost like a standstill. But what is anticipated is a wave that will come. So I know Food Banks Canada has said that when the recession hit a few years back, it was a six. It was six months out before they started to see that that wave hit them. Uh, people will use whatever resources they can access first until they're kind of they kind of hit the bottom, and then they will access food banks. So we do anticipate that. We think that as those as those supports diminish, that is when we will see kind of the bigger wave hit. Um, our concern would be more in stock um, as when people don't gather the same and they don't have larger events, we don't see the same sort of food collection that we would normally see. And so this fall, that would be my, my concern is that we would continue to see our shelves stocked for the people that are coming in. We certainly haven't seen a reduction in numbers. It's not as though it's been quiet. And we have seen an increase some months over over what we would see on average. Um, but we anticipate that that larger wave will come a little bit further out. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll sort of issue that challenge to all of my fellow citizens in North Perth that uh, it's time for us to step up and uh, help the fill the shelves at uh, Salvation Army. Um, I will be... Uh, Stopping by with some contribution myself in uh, imminent days, uh, Gwyneth. And Councillor Rothwell. Thanks very much, uh, Mayor Todd and, and Gwyneth. Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, it's been my pleasure as long uh, as well as uh, certainly Mayor Todd and Deputy Mayor uh, Callum, as well as uh, Councillor Seiler to have uh, you on our COVID uh, uh, recovery action group. Uh, you've been an integral part of that. And I appreciate uh, your work as well as certainly uh, Salvation Army uh, for our entire community. So uh, we really appreciate that. My one uh, question for you is for all the gardeners out there, uh, what uh, does the Salvation Army in terms of the food bank, uh, can you receive uh, uh, fresh vegetables uh, as opposed to the standard uh, canned goods uh, and uh, so on? If you could just let us know, yeah. because of course the frost is upon us, uh, could be. Uh, but I know that uh, many gardens have been fairly plentiful. But, uh, keep up the good work. I look forward to the response. Thank you. Absolutely. We actually have refrigeration here as well. Um, and we would like, we prefer that uh, there's a, a large percentage of what we're giving that's actually fresh produce. So we purchase produce and we also take in from both the community garden and from uh, private donors as well. And I would also say that throughout the year, whether you're a gardener or not, we we can receive things like um, meat and dairy as long as it is uh, butcher stamped. Uh, we can't take if you if we can't take from local hunters, unfortunately, unless it's been processed at a butcher. Um, that just it goes with our, our health guidelines through Food Banks Canada. But as long as it's got a butcher stamp on it, we can take it and produce as well. So, yep. Thank you very much. Anyone else, uh, Clerk Bearfelds? And uh, thank you, Councillor Rothwell, for pointing out Gwyneth's significant contribution to our COVID recovery. Uh, uh, quite right. We are glad that you were able to join us. We know it's been a busy time for you and, and so appreciate that service to your community in, in yet another way. Um, very much appreciated. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gwyneth. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And uh, next up, we have a delegation. Uh, Mr. Paul Horn, 
who in, resides in Gowan's town, would like to address council on a matter related to his property. Uh, Mr. Horn, welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me all right? We can. Okay, through your worship, Mayor Kassenberg, members of council and municipal staff. Thank you for, for receiving me tonight as a delegation. My name is Paul Horn, and I'm here to talk to you about the zoning on a portion of my property located at 8634 Road 164 in the village of Gownstown. The property I'm referring to is commonly known in the area as the old Uncle Aldi's ice cream shop. Coincidentally, that's actually how we tell people where we live. My wife Tammy and I developed the Uncle Aldi's facility from scratch in 2002 with guidance and recommendations from North Perth municipal staff, MTO staff, and public health unit staff. We followed the prescribed planning and approval process to satisfy all of the requirements for proper land usage for a retail food service facility. Our proposal was approved by council unanimously at that time. When we developed this facility, we paid for various planning, approval, and building fees. The facility on this portion of property consists of a 380 square foot commercial building, a parking lot for approximately 18 vehicles, a septic system, and a shared commercial entrance. In 2010, I amended the zoning of the facility to allow for the sale of automobiles. I did inquire about village commercial zoning at that time, but I was informed that that was not an option available to me. Usage remained specific and the allowance to sell ice cream was taken away. At this point in time, this commercial facility has sat vacant for almost four years. We have had various rental inquiries. However, the restrictive nature of the zoning, the expenses involved, the time required and the uncertainty of the zoning amendment approval process have proven to be very problematic to potential tenants, to say the very least. In a nutshell, the portion of our property that we pay commercial taxes on every month is virtually unrentable, and as it currently stands, unusable to us. We do have a daughter who would like to reopen the ice cream shop next summer. I had hoped that the 2010 bylaw could simply be replaced. In discussion with municipal staff, reverting back to the original usage must follow the planning process. They feel our pro proposal to revert back to the originally approved zoning requires a zoning amendment. I don't mind following the process. I understand that and even a repeal process would have the same requirement. However, I do question the need for the municipality to charge me a second time for a previously approved zoning allowance that I, I have already paid for in full back in 2002. The facility is exactly the same as it was when it was originally constructed, specifically as an ice cream shop. We're not proposing anything new or anything that wasn't already there in the past. I hope you can understand my position. To my knowledge, I own one of the only retail storefronts in North Perth. It requires me to come to council with my hat in my hand, a check in my pocket, and a complete justification to ask your permission to simply change the product we sell or to rent it out to a potential tenant. I'd, I'd ask you to put yourself in my shoes for a minute and try to imagine what it's like owning a commercial property with the restrictions I have try to develop a private business plan that requires public notice, public meetings, and the municipal council's blessing, or try renting it to a potential tenant who insists on confidentiality when any competitor, or for that matter, any resident of the municipality can object or even appeal the council's decision and had months of time and incur horrific amounts of expense. Some of you may recall that I actually experienced that in 2010. So don't think for a second that it can't happen. Over the years, I've spent thousands of dollars on municipal fees for this particular portion of property, and I've paid thousands upon thousands of dollars in commercial property taxes, even while it has sat vacant. I'm hoping you can see your way clear to allow us to revert to the original approved usage without the added expense of a duplicate zoning approval that already exists. 
thank you for your time and I can answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Horn. Um, uh, councilors, do you have any questions or comments at this point? Do we have anyone showing indication? Councilor Duncan. Yes, I guess my question goes back to uh, why was, like, it's more for planning staff, I guess, is what, why was the, the ice cream use removed from the, the property and why was the zoning set up in the manner that it was set up originally? I guess I'm just having a hard time understanding why that was done. Okay, um, let's first try to see if we can get a response to that from Councillor, from um, Mr. Yilmaz. Sean, you with us still? Yes. You know, you have any on this one? Yep, uh, well, sorry, thank you. Um, so this is a uh, historic zoning bylaw amendment, um, which spanned over the past, I mean, almost a couple decades. So I was not around for most of this, but um, briefly looking through previous planning reports, uh, the um, amendment originally allowed the ice cream shop use um, through a site-specific future development zone. The, uh, the, this portion of the property is within the FD, um, I can't remember the exact site specific number, but, um, and when the change of use was proposed, um, it was with the understanding that the previous use of the ice cream shop was going to be removed, um, at which time when the new use was approved, the, uh, the previous use was removed. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, um, council seems quiet on this one. Um, I, I, I sort of have a question here, um, and, and I guess it's a question perhaps for the CAO or the clerk, and, and that question is with regards to the Municipal Acts provisions for um, various uh, approaches to supporting um, commerce and industry, there are restrictions um, that, that, you know, commonly are called bonusing, but basically uh, intend not to um, uh, allow the municipalities to show favoritism or certain sorts of support, um, at least as I understand it. So uh, maybe CEO Snell, do you have any comments? Like, are we treading into this boundary? Is there a clear path of an approach that we can use that, that doesn't sort of invoke a specter of that? Chris, are you with us? Sorry, just my, I'm having trouble with my mute button. I just, I would have to look into um, whether this would, would um, constitute bonus thing. I'm, I'm a little unclear that it, that it would at this point, but I'd probably want to seek um, a legal opinion on, on if this would look like bonusing. Uh, Councillor Rothwell next. Thank you, Mayor Todd. And uh, certainly I was around uh, back in 2002 and uh, in 2010 when we dealt with uh, this matter uh, through North Perth uh, Council. And uh, clearly, as uh, Mr. Horn will recall, it was at his request, uh, first of all, and or their request, the property owners in 2002, that the Uncle shop uh, moved forward. Uh, there was significant conversations with the Minister of Transportation in particular to ensure that we could uh, have access there. Their uh, regulations were fairly strict, and one of the reasons why uh, they did allow it moving forward was because of the reduced speed zone in Gowanstown. Uh, as well as the fact that it was a relatively small uh, shop and it wasn't expected to uh, create a uh, hazard with respect to uh, vehicles turning and so on. Things changed obviously in 2010 and the desire at that time was to move forward to change that use uh, over to the uh, uh, car sales business uh, for yourself. And uh, again, it was uh, based on discussions with MTO as I recall specifically is that uh, we had to have a very specific uh, zoning that uh, uh, negated uh, 
uh, the uh, commercial flow for both A, ice cream, and B, uh, auto sales in the same uh, area. So that's the reason why a choice was made, and you agreed at that time that uh, you wanted to deal with the car sales and car sales only. So that's the reason why I can recall specifically back in 2010 is that council did uh, move forward, and as you uh, rightly noted, it was appealed off to the Ontario Municipal Board, and the Ontario Municipal Board, as I recall, upheld that decision of council uh, to uh, move forward on that basis. Uh, public process is a crucial uh, aspect as we move forward, and certainly the application fees, which North Per charges, uh, are in order to address uh, uh, the uh, review uh, process, public uh, notification, and so on. And I, I uh, while I understand your uh, issues or concern, I assure you that uh, no one else that I'm aware of in North Perth that's gone through planning applications and so on is exempt from uh, having to uh, go through a public notification process. Knowing full well that uh, public disclosure of uh, uh, private uh, initiation of uh, businesses and so on is an issue of concern. Nevertheless, uh, those are the uh, issues that we have to uh, look at going forward. And frankly, uh, uh, I think on this basis that uh, you have to have some sort of confidence in terms of the fact that in 2002 you had a business which uh, was successful and council uh, fully endorsed back at that time, uh, as well as planning MTO and others uh, did endorse, is that hopefully uh, you would have that same uh, confidence uh, moving forward. Not saying there's a guarantee, but I think it uh, has to be understood is that that's the way the process has to work. Thank you. Councilor Barons. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I have two comments. The first one is um, I am slightly concerned about uh, precedent setting. Um, and my question to the clerk or our planner is have we ever done um, this type of process before for someone who wanted to change their zoning. Um, and really the second one is, um, even though his property is in future development, just for clarification, he can still, um, if he produces the farm product, like the garlic and the sweet corn and that, on his property, he is certainly able to continue to do that um, irregardless of this zoning. So the, the farm gate process is a separate issue from the zoning process for the ice cream shop. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barron. Yes, that's our understanding too. Um, okay. Um, we need maybe, there was a suggestion of input uh, with regards to the matter of precedent. Um, Pat, are you equipped to speak to that or should we turn to Sean or CEO Snow? Okay, so staff is suggesting uh, that, uh, you know, depending on council's sensitivity to this matter, um, staff would need some time to research um, the history and determine whether there have been precedents and also to seek legal opinion um, uh, if we were to proceed and, and find a, a try to find path that would be, a, a, you know, a viable to, to make this happen. So um, any other questions or comments on this delegation at this time? Okay, uh, council, is it your will to ask staff uh, to bring forward a report that addresses uh, one, the matter of precedent, uh, two, uh, a, you know, clear history of what's happened here, and three, um, whether uh, there are legal implications or a, a reasonable path that uh, would withstand the test of legality on this one. Is that council's will or no? Not all at once. Okay, so Councillor Richardson is indicating that he would be okay to uh, do a little homework and, and get an opinion on this matter. Um, other councillors? Okay, so Councillor Andreessen agrees with that. Anyone vehemently opposed to um, a resolution that would uh, instruct staff to, uh, or direct staff to prepare a report for us that address a couple of these loose matters that we want further understanding on. 
Okay, so so most of council is is indicating uh, through the chat function that they're supportive of that. Uh, that seems to be a will of council here. Um, you would need a resolution. Shall we do that now? Okay, so um, uh, you know, resolve that the council, of the municipality of North Perth, instruct staff to prepare a report pertaining to uh, the request from Mr. Paul Horn related to um, a conversion of uh, use of his commercial um, area on his property in Gowanstown, uh, which includes consideration of the following. Uh, first, the, uh, the matter of, um, of precedent, setting precedent and a history of precedent in this matter uh, made by previous councils and two, a legal opinion about uh, the approach or, or, or all approaches that have been laid on the table to this date pertaining to this matter. I missed anything obvious, Council? Help me improve the resolution. Anyone want to speak, Pat? Okay, so I, I think we have a resolution that, that sounds like it's somewhat workable then. Danette, you largely got that. Uh, Councillor Anstead, can I call on you to serve as our mover for that? Yes, I would move that. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Behrens, will you serve as seconder? Yes, I will second that. Thanks. All right. Any further discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. Who are we missing? Councillor Richardson, what say you? I'm in favor, my vote's thank not you. working here. That, that's carried, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Horn, for your presentation and uh, it was a pleasure to hear that wonderful voice. Um, thank you for your time. I yeah, appreciate yeah. your time tonight, Council. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, with us a, a, a delegation uh, Mr. Al Dam, who is joining us, uh, he is the Provincial Poultry Specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And uh, Mr. Dam has uh, submitted uh, a lot of content to this council to support our discussions and thinking around urban hens. And, um, and he has uh, a, a somewhat briefer presentation than the materials uh, submitted to council. Uh, for us tonight and, and is available to answer our questions as well, which is just an excellent opportunity to have such an esteemed guest. So Mr. Dam, welcome and uh, please take the floor. All right, well, well, thank you. I hope you can all hear. We can. I think, uh, yeah, sounds like you're okay. So yes, I've provided you uh, lots of information um, on urban poultry. I do these uh, discussions with various municipalities actually a fair bit, especially since uh, the onset of COVID uh, as lots of um, urban poultry bylaws are being talked about and people are talking about things like food security and mental health. Uh, one thing with this, this challenge I see it is that uh, I'm just concerned uh, just off the top that uh, I'm going to call them pandemic pets. There's a lot of people that are asking for for things like poultry without the realization of what's happening. Uh, if you guys are looking at an urban poultry bylaw, and I'm guessing it's just going to be eggs, correct? Not meat? You don't know yet? Okay, well. Keep talking. Okay, if I can, uh, if I can throw just a out from uh, the information that you've been given, one of the biggest things you'll need to do is is have a proper education for anyone who's participating in a, in a program. Uh, when I have these talks with municipalities, usually we uh, discuss it. It goes to council. If it gets voted ahead, there's usually a pilot project, and then next year I get to talk to someone in the pilot project where things have gone wrong. Um, so. Like a lot of people think that having birds is just like having a cat or a dog. I will say that's not the case because you generally don't eat anything that comes out of your cat or your dog. Uh, so we have some food safety issues to deal with there. Uh, but education is key. I do a lot of work with the Poultry Industry Council. 
uh, on this. This is becoming a larger part of my work plan, even though my mainstay is supposed to be the commercial poultry industry. Um, suggestions, like when you talk about number of birds, if you're planning to go ahead with this, uh, less is more. You're gonna get essentially an egg a day out of these hens when they're in full production. So if people are saying, well, you know, you know a dozen hens would be fine. Well, that's a dozen eggs a day, right? So you do the math out pretty quick and suddenly you're swimming in eggs. Uh, most municipalities are looking at four to six hens. Um, no roosters, of course. Hens don't need roosters to, uh, to produce eggs and you're just asking for nuisance complaints when it comes to noise. Uh, if you're gonna overwinter these hens, that's a huge issue because I'm sure your bylaw enforcement officer or provincial animal welfare folks are not gonna to wanna to have to deal with uh, blind birds from high ammonia or birds that have lost toes, combs, or wattles because of uh, improper overwintering. Um, if people can't overwinter, sometimes they just wanna kill the hens. So how do you deal with your dead stock? Or disposal of hens. Um, you'll be dealing with challenges with urban vermin, as I call it. So everything eats chicken, including the neighbor's dog, uh, cats, skunks, foxes, um, raptors, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I was uh, working with the uh, city of Sudbury on a very similar urban poultry bylaw a couple years ago, and they decided against it because they have a challenge with uh, bears in Sudbury. Uh, I'm guessing you don't have bear issues yet in North Perth, but that's just another thing that eats chickens. Um, food safety is going to be an issue. I mentioned that before. Uh, when it comes to urban poultry, um, and I guess looking back at legislation, because it's a supply managed commodity, uh, if you don't own quota, uh, it's only farm gate sales that you're allowed. Uh, what farm gate sales means is that you can post a sign up in your driveway saying eggs for sale, you cannot advertise, you cannot sell to a restaurant, you cannot sell at the local farmer's market because if you have, because these, bur uh, these eggs aren't graded, and we go through a mochum of shell integrity and, and freshness. If there is a issue with a food safety concern with it, we have at least a chance of finding out where those people got sick from when it's farm gate sale only. Um, so that's uh, that's a really big important part of that is uh, no no sales other than farm gate sales. When it comes to health issues, uh, birds get a lot of diseases that wild birds get. So from an animal health and welfare standpoint, from a veterinary care standpoint, um, there's gonna need to be a desire for some sort of healthcare program. Uh, we are educating a lot of non-poultry vets, small flock vets um, that have an interest in this. So trying to find one is an issue. Our commercial poultry vets generally don't wanna deal with backyard flocks because uh, we are kept quite busy with our, with our commercial flocks. Uh, I mentioned dead stock is an issue. I got a lot of folks that tell me they live in the city and if they have a bird that dies, they just throw it in the garbage. Uh, that can technically be considered a biohazard, which uh, your garbage collection folks may not appreciate. Uh, so then it comes down to, you know, then I get asked, well, I throw a chicken I buy in the grocery store out in the garbage and that's not a problem. Well, the chicken you bought at the grocery store was deemed fit for human consumption by a by an inspector at a processing plant. Uh, your bird may have died from some sort of disease that could be zoonotic. So that is an issue you'll have to worry about when it comes to dead stock. Um, end of lay hens can be an issue. And actually, that's maybe something I'll bring up is uh, what hens you get for egg laying. We strongly recommend that you buy ready to lay hens, so hens that are at least 18 weeks of age that are already in, that are sexually mature, that are starting to lay eggs. Reason we say that versus buying a baby chick and then feeding it for 18 weeks is that those hens get a between seven and nine different vaccinations in those 18 weeks. Build us a very strong and robust hen that'll produce eggs for a year at least. Um, so we know those birds are healthy and have got a lot of uh, strong antibodies to various diseases. A day old chick that you get may have a couple of vaccinations from the hatchery and that's it. So uh, you'll have some challenges that way, let alone the fact that a lot of people don't know how to brood chicks uh, to sexual maturity. Uh, we talked a little bit about eggs versus meat, what you're gonna do 
with those birds, uh, most municipalities are just looking at, at egg layers. Um, but when it comes down to it, like I said, education is going to be an issue. Complaints are, are going to be a challenge because you'll be dealing with potentially noise odor, flies, um, manure. So from the manure standpoint itself, uh, each hen will produce about one pound of high test every week. That manure is that potent that uh, if they're putting it in their black composter in the backyard, it'll actually kill the compost. The other issue we have with poultry manure is we, I strongly recommend that that is not used in your, your garden. Your flower bed is one thing, but in your vegetable garden, um, there are things like salmonella that chickens can have that can be transmitted through the manure. You put the manure in the vegetable garden, your peas and your potatoes and your tomatoes can actually pick up that salmonella from that manure and it can be brought into the, the vegetable. So we're suggesting uh, that if you have manure that you do not um, use it right away, you compost it at least for a few months. Uh, the other issue I've run into with, with manure um, is depending upon whether or not you have any wellhead protection areas in North Perth, those, that nutrient from the manure uh, can be quite water soluble. So that can cause you some uh, water quality issues in the region, especially if you're in a wellhead protection area or a WAPA. Uh, slaughter could be an issue. Uh, I'm guessing we're not talking meat birds. If you are talking meat birds, then it comes to an issue of slaughter. You are not allowed to sell, sorry, let me back this up a little bit. If you own the bird and slaughter it yourself and consume it yourself, you're allowed to do that because if that bird is unfit to eat, you only get yourself sick. You cannot sell those that, that meat that's not inspected. Just as your uh, person from uh, uh, that talked a little earlier, they cannot accept uh, meat from hunters because it hasn't been inspected. Um, if you're dealing with end of lay hens that someone does not want to overwinter, you know, are they going to be slaughtering that in the garage? Are they going to be throwing them over the fence? Is this going to become an issue? And where this finally runs down to is some disease challenges that can in fact uh, impact commercial industry. So in, in your region, you have got a lot of poultry barns, whether it's turkey, layer, broiler, or broiler breeder. Um, if we ended up with an avian influenza challenge uh, in there and say one of your urban poultry backyard flocks picked up avian influenza from a migrating duck and it was a highly pathogenic avian influenza that can cause issues in commercial poultry uh, and that person took that duck to a veterinarian as they're supposed to and it's a uh, avian influenza a serotype that causes this concern that uh, could potentially have an impact for definitely that flock because Canadian Food Inspection Agency will come in and they'll destroy all those birds in that flock, probably set up a quarantine zone uh, and lock all those birds in a five or a 10K circle around that. And if it starts jumping from flock to flock, they could nuke everything in that quarantine zone. When I say nuke, I mean, we actually, we have no vaccine for avian influenza. We have a scorched earth policy in Canada when it comes to that foreign animal disease, where we just destroy everything in the path uh, to kill the disease. So we can, because that impacts our trade with uh, other countries. So that being said, you're going to want to know where every flock is in case there is an issue, both for noise and odor complaints or whatever else, but also from a disease challenge if we end up having one. Uh, that is distilled down to about, what I just did is about a three-hour lecture that I give normally when it comes to urban poultry. So I think at that point, I'll just uh, open up to any questions if you have any. So Mr. Dam is also going to offer council classes on being brief and concise in, in messages, apparently. Uh, we look forward to that. And we'll, we'll call on you for that in the near future. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. I, I, that was, Councillor Richardson, you're up. Questions. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg, and thank you, Mr. Dan. That's a very, very interesting uh, report and quite the uh, amount of information that you gave us. Uh, just by happen chance today that I was uh, speaking with an organization that you had made mention, the uh, uh, Poultry Industry Council. Could you possibly elaborate a little bit about the um, 
either the success or the pilot project is being spearheaded in Georgina, Ontario, because I gather that they've got a very, um, they've had a lot of um, discussions regarding this topic as well as about urban hens, and they're certainly not allowing them just to be a free-for-all by any means, and it's under very controlled uh, situations that they're allowing people to have hens and it's very limited pilot and there's uh, timing and education that is a requirement before getting issuance of a license. Could you just possibly elaborate because um, I'm not sure if you were involved uh, with that or not. Just I'd be question about that. Yep. I was actually intimately involved in that. So Town of Georgina was looking at a uh, urban poultry uh, bylaw. They decided to go ahead with a pilot project and part of that pilot project included education. Uh, so that was actually our urban poultry webinar we did back in April. We had participants from across the province and to be honest, across the country. Uh, but town of Georgina actually had, I think about a dozen folks that were part of their pilot project participate in that urban poultry uh, seminar uh, that PIC has actually recorded that's on their PIC website as a, as a pay per use or pay per view um, lecture. Uh, but further to that, uh, after the morning lecture, which was the three hours that I condensed into the 10 minutes, uh, we also had a Q&A session uh, specifically with the town of Georgina and the residents. So uh, the bylaw enforcement person there went over their, their proposed bylaw, how it was going to work, how the pilot project was going to work. And uh, community members were able to participate back and forth and poultry industry council and I were still on the line after lunch in that afternoon session to answer any technical questions they had. Uh, that was, I think a, a very successful use of the educational tools we had because this was post COVID. So we were all doing what we're doing right now using a WebEx or a Zoom, Zoom type call. Um, if you get a chance to see the poultry industry council um, webinar, you'll see yours truly there with a bunch of prompts that I was showing folks how uh, nest boxes work and proper brooding and all the rest of that. Uh, but to be honest, part of what that did was convince some people not to be part of the pilot project, right? If, if this is more than they realize that it is, it's not just playing with your puppy or your kitten. Um, there's a lot involved in this. And when we do these urban poultry workshops, I used to do them with PIC every year uh, in March, out of the room, maybe 10% of them to 10 to 20% of them would go, we've never had birds before, we're here to learn. And after we're done, because I even go over, if you can see this or not, how to properly surgically dislocate a bird, if you're gonna have to dispatch a bird yourself, uh, we've had people like leave the room crying, realizing that they've never, they didn't think they'd have to do that. So we put it all on the table and this is, this is what you're dealing with. Councillor Richardson, supplemental. Yes, uh, and thank you for that. I, and I understand that, uh, and I'm in full agreement that uh, hopefully going forward with this, that education will be a significant part of that because um, as much as I think it would be of benefit to be able to have the availability of the eggs, but I think education about all of the different aspects of chicken husbandry, I think is absolutely essential. But I would think that going forward, that having a significant portion um, of education would be a mandatory requirement because like I've said before in previous meetings, the last thing that I wanna see happen is that if this goes forward is that people getting hens and this putting them in a box under the porch because that's not, that's not good for anybody and we certainly don't wanna see that. We wanna make sure that uh, we're doing our due diligence and I think with something like this that it's not a fad that if somebody wants to do about it, they need to be properly educated about any inherent risks that are involved and it's that can be case point and said as well for when children get close to dogs or to anything like that you need to be educated about um, the benefits and the detriments um, of doing this so thank you again for your for your time and your incredible amount of information yeah. that uh, you have provided absolutely eyes wide open because I, I find with this kind of information um, you know, when they say that they want food security, I get that. If they want to teach Johnny where their food comes from, I get that too. The mental health aspects are there. When they tell me they want to get cheap eggs, I laugh because that'll be the most expensive eggs you will ever raise. Um, you can get eggs two bucks a dozen at Choppers today. I picked up a couple dozen eggs. 
Uh, those eggs will cost you between 10 and $80 a dozen, depending upon what kind of structure you have set up and what kind of birds you bought. So anyways, that's just, that's a bit, but I see there's other questions too. Sure. Before I invite other councillors into this, I want to remind councillors, this is not the period for debate. We are asking an expert questions and uh, we do have a designated slot on our agenda tonight to have a discussion about uh, about urban hens so um, if you've indicated because you want to express opinions or stuff uh, let's hold that off until a little bit later in the meeting uh, so I have a, a speaker's list I think Councillor Johnston is up next Do you have some questions for our expert Councillor Johnston yes thank you Mayor Todd uh, Al uh, thank you for all the information a question about disease and do you have any instances of disease being passed from backyard flocks? Mainly what I'm, my concern is children. Um, I can only find American statistics where there's uh, upwards of 10 deaths um, every six months in the United States from backyard flocks of children 10 and under due to salmonella. Uh, do you know of any instances in Canada where this happens? Uh, we've had that. There was actually a good recorded case in Alberta where there was a number of uh, people that got sick from uh, backyard flocks. They, the, these were actually chicks from a hatchery uh, that was pushed out in the small flock community. And the breeder flocks were salmonella positive. And then that led to some uh, instances where children and immunocompromised folks became sick also. Um, and, a, and a lot of things... That go with that uh when you look at feed and water they have to be clean like that's a way to spread disease uh vermin can bring disease into that you know so yes we have a salmonella reduction program in the commercial egg industry so if we actually test our chicks and our barns and our hens for salmonella if they become positive any part of that uh moment like if if uh, we test some pullets that are being raised and they are they test salmonella positive we will actually destroy those hens because we do, do not want that coming in now from a backyard flock that's another reason why i was pushing for ready to lay hens right because we know that they'll have been vaccinated for a lot of different things um but yeah like a, a clean nest box good feed that's not spoiled and clean water will be critical but yeah it is it is possible and there's a lot of undiagnosed salmonellas that happen that we don't know where they uh folks become sick from but like i said the young the old and immunocompromised are the ones we're concerned about so uh, if you want i think i can find that that case in alberta that was about from three or four years ago that it was very well documented and traced back um locally in ontario i don't think i have anything recent that talks about salmonella infection due to backyard poultry pastor okay. anstead next Thanks, Mayor Kasenberg, through you. Thanks again, Al, as well, for your presentation. Very informative, and your PowerPoint presentation was as well. Um, just a question surrounding um, municipalities in Ontario, and I don't know if you'd have insight into this. Do we have rough numbers of how many municipalities across the province have implemented some sort of a backyard uh, urban hen bylaw? I do not know. Uh, that's, okay. that's information I haven't been able to glean quite yet. Um, it's, it's come up enough to the point where I was actually supposed to um, talk at the Rural Ontario, Roma, Rural Ontario Municipal Association meeting uh, on enforcement or the AMO meeting about backyard poultry uh, to have information available to like your bylaw enforcement and your clerks on that. Uh, I was supposed to talk to that about that in May at their conference that they have every year and that of course got cancelled. Right. Um, I do have... One of the to-do lists I have is to, is to put together a presentation specific for urban uh, poultry to give to the to AMO to have available for instances like this as opposed to uh, your poor folks having to try and collect information and try and delve into it. The, the scary thing we have with this is that there's a lot of crap out in the interweb <laughs> in terms of information that people can collect and some of it is really awful. That is part of the reason why I work with Poultry Industry Council. OMAFRA has a small flock webpage on the Ontario Animal Health Network. Uh, we all work together to provide good information to Ontarians about, about this so we don't get into the, you know, I heard this was a good idea type of issue. Sure, okay, thank you. 
Uh, Councillor Rothwell next. Thanks, Mayor Todd, and uh, thank you, Al, for your presentation. I really appreciate that. Uh, Al, you did mention uh, specifically the uh, your knowledge of uh, North Perth and uh, our extent of uh, poultry uh, and, and other uh, uh, commercial flocks that we have uh, throughout. Uh, my issue of concern, and I, I've had conversations with uh, some of the uh, uh, poultry uh, uh, farmers uh, surrounding my understanding is that we're going to be expecting some sort of response from uh, uh, their organizations uh, here regarding uh, concerns that they have. But in your work with the uh, uh, Poultry Industry Council, uh, is there uh, issues of concern uh, that, uh, you know, beyond what you've stated in terms of just uh, basic concerns about the interaction, a possible interaction with avian influ uh, influenza being the probably the most significant one uh, for from uh, urban hens or urban flocks uh, through to the commercial side? And is there any documentation about that uh, here within Ontario or in Canada or elsewhere in terms of, you know, where that's actually truly been the issue where there's been a, a jump from a, a infected uh, urban hen situation into a commercial flock? Thank you. Okay. Um, so our commercial industry, I, for my career with OMAF, I've been pounding into the commercial guys the, the importance of biosecurity and keeping your farm secure and not letting uh, you know wild birds enter the barn and and not making sure you the people who come into your barn change your boots and all the rest of that stuff we give the exact same information to the urban poultry folks um, and in fact if you go on the Ontario Animal Health Network we have a list of all the disease advisories we've pushed out over the last number of years so, and in fact, uh, today we actually pushed out and it's, it's probably about three or four weeks late is an advisory for the wild bird migration that's actually happening now. So the, the, the wild bird flocks are, are migrating south right now. And this is a high risk time uh, for poultry folks that have birds extensively housed. But we even mentioned that to farmers saying, okay, you know, make sure you're very diligent about changing your boots when you're going to the barn too, because um, you could have a flock of geese fly overhead and, you know, the droppings end up in your driveway and then you will step into that into your barn. Uh, the urban poultry folks are no different than that. Uh, diseases like infectious laryngotracheitis, a number of the last one, the last number of advisories we've had on that have mostly been small flock. Um, and ILT is a disease we vaccinate hens for. We don't vaccinate broiler chickens for. So that creates a lot of anxiety when we have a small flock in a region pop up with ILT for the farmers that are in that area. Um, and we, we break it down by county. We can't go any less than that because of privacy. Concerns when a when disease a disease bird comes into the uh, animal health lab in Guelph. So ILT is one, salmonella, like any of the commercial poultry diseases we have, backyard flocks come get right. And um, you know, is is there risk of exposure? Absolutely, but it all depends on how strong the biosecurity program is between farm to farm and city to farm and vice versa. And even amongst your um, we'll call them potential participants in this, in the urban poultry side. Guelph has had uh, urban poultry for a long time. And I remember a number of years ago, uh, we had a lot of coccidia issues in the small flock group. And it was traced back to these guys trading birds back and forth with each other. And that coccidia disease would, would be spread from flock to flock. So uh, there are, there is a lot of diseases that can be um, transmitted. The risk depends on a lot of different issues, but then we throw in wild birds on top of that. And even things like uh, rodents, like if you'll have rodent, rodents and insects, uh, potential issues with urban flocks, they can move diseases from within the neighborhood or they can bring diseases to the next house, right? Like that's why we, we are so uh, diligent on our rodent control programs, both in poultry and in your own house. 
Thanks very much, Al. I just, uh, and not to take uh, too much additional time, but uh, I recall, I think it was uh, seven years ago, perhaps eight was the closest uh, we had within Perth County of uh, avian influenza and its impact uh, on uh, birds in Oxford County yep. and uh, on the periphery of Perth County. And that uh, had a significant impact on, on uh, those operations and they were substantial in size. And I'm not directing this to say it directly impacted uh, the uh, urban situation at all. It's just a matter of just what we're talking about is disease and, and the impact of that on our commercial flocks could be devastating. That's that's all my, my point is. I'm not saying it would yep. be associated with urban hens, don't get me wrong, uh, but it uh, th that's the closest situation I can recall that we had here in the Perth uh, County context and it was down in sort of Perth East on the periphery of uh, Oxford County that was directly impacted on that. Yeah, and that was in 2015 when we had highly pathogenic H5N2, even influenza in Oxford County. It, it was in three different locations. Um, and I, I guess another thing to get your head wrapped around is uh, the commercial poultry situation could actually even have an impact on your urban poultry, right? If, if we have, say we have an even influenza outbreak right outside Listowel, we'll just say we'll pick Listowel for an example. Um, in 2004, in the Fraser Valley, when, when they had to literally nuke the whole Fraser Valley in BC of every bird that was out there, CFIA was actually even going to, they were going to the municipality saying, who's got backyard flocks? The municipality didn't know. So they had to go door to door and say, we need to take your birds and we need to destroy them, which caused a huge amount of uh, anxiety and lawsuits. Um so that would be another thing that would fall upon the municipality is that you would like if if we had a foreign animal disease break that happened within your catchment area or within the court your, if you fell within that quarantine zone cfia would be probably knocking on your door fairly quickly to say we need the names of everyone who's got birds in here because we need to stamp this disease out if it's a foreign animal disease of some sort so it can go both ways uh but the ramifications could be quite large and uh one thing about the oxford county situation we had back in 2015 is that the municipality actually has a pretty significant role to play uh, in the, that disease eradication, which uh, came to a bit of a, as a bit of a surprise. So since 2015, we've been doing a lot of emergency preparedness exercises with multiple municipalities, both of the, and having provincial and federal involvement in that so that all three players are, are aware of the roles that each has to play. And like I said, I'm, I was involved in 2015 I understand the roles I need to play. The, the feds do. I just, I, I, I always feel bad for the municipal players in that because this is usually something, yes, you go through emergency preparedness exercises for extreme weather, tornadoes and whatnot, but when it comes to animal disease, it's a different kettle of fish, pardon the pun. Or it's a different bird. So. <laughs> oh, you're good. Thank you very much, Al. <laughs> All right, any further questions or comments from council? Okay, um, I'm gonna propose, thank you, Mr. Dam, uh, for joining us. Um, wonderful presentation, very insightful. Uh, we appreciate the wealth of experience you have and, and Ontario is lucky to have um, someone as you in its uh, service uh, dealing with uh, these kinds of issues or with poultry. So much appreciated you giving us some time tonight. Uh, I know that I speak on behalf of council with uh, that uh, appreciation. Um, and uh, and you're welcome to um, exit our call now. Um, council, I'm gonna propose that we take a brief bio break and return to 9.02. So let's call it uh, eight minutes. Uh, let's take an eight minute pause.
Okay, councilors, I invite your return to the council table, virtual though it might be. So that brings us to agenda item number five, reports from departments and key staff. We have no reports this evening from the CAO's department. And that brings us then to reports from the clerk's department, which is item 5.2. For item 5.2.1, council was provided with a report from North Perth planner, Sean Yilmaz, which outlines the request for a zoning bylaw amendment related to land known as the nickel properties specifically in the Elma Ward, but generally considered by the public as part of Listowel. I'll ask Mr. Yilmaz to review this proposed matter. Yes, thank you. Uh, the applicant on behalf of the property owner has submitted an application to amend the Municipality of North Perth Zoning Bylaw. The amendment seeks to remove a portion of the subject lands from the Agricultural A-2 zone and the Agricultural A-57 zone and place it within a special area commercial uh, zone known as C5-4. This site-specific zone includes provisions permitting the establishment of commercial and residential uses within a mixed-use development. Uh, a joint public meeting was held virtually and remotely uh, at the July 6, Council, uh, North, July 6, 2020 North Perth Council meeting uh, to, to discuss a proposed official plan amendment known as OPA 184 to the County of Perth official plan and the associated zoning bylaw amendment, which is subject of tonight's uh, discussion. The proposed amendment to the zoning bylaw was deferred by council pending the result of OPA 186. Since that time, the council of the County of Perth adopted amendment number 184, um, excuse me, I, I might've just messed up. It's 184, not 186, um, to the County of Perth official plan uh, on the August 6, 2020 council meeting. The OPA adds new clauses to section 6.6.5, special policy area E, uh, to permit the development of residential units and commercial uses within a mixed use site and provide requirements for development of these uses. The 20 day appeal period concluded on September 3rd, 2020, with one appeal filed objecting the official plan amendment. At the public meeting, the appellant expressed concerns with the space allotted for the food store use, which was previously seeking a maximum retail floor area of 2,100 square meters or 22,000 square feet. Staff worked with the applicant and the appellant to reduce the total retail floor area requirement to 930 square meters or 10,000 square feet with the understanding that this would address concerns previously noted. However, the appellant has filed an appeal ahead of the decision uh, of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. Um, but since the public meeting, North Per staff have revised the previous bylaw uh, to reduce the space permitted for food store use, as, this, as I just mentioned. The bylaw proposed will allow a maximum of 930 square meters or 10,000 square feet, which originally was pr proposed to be uh, 2,100 square meters or 22,000 square feet. Additionally, an increase in the minimum residential den density has been included within the bylaw which will require a minimum density of 40 units per hectare. The proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement and conforms to the County of Perth official plan as per OPA 184. However, as one, OPA 184 is under appeal, the bylaw wording has been adjusted to come into effect if and or when OPA 184 comes into effect. Staff is therefore recommending council approve the application uh, for an amendment to the North Perth zoning bylaw. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Yilmaz. Councillors, questions or first comments? Do we have anyone? Your thoughts? Hey, Councillor Rothwell. Oh, sorry. sorry. Councillor Rothwell, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I thought you were waiting there. Sorry, the uh, question I have for uh, Sean, and thank you for the report, Sean, uh, is uh, we're, uh, have we got confirmation from the appellant that they're satisfied as well as the applicant that they're satisfied with the uh, proposed uh, revisions uh, to the uh, uh, reduced uh, 
square footage uh, on the uh, commercial uh, uh, side, and secondly, that the applicant is satisfied with the minimum 40 units per hectare. I think you said minimum 40 units per hectare residential density. Uh, yes, thank you. Good question. So this conversation was between uh, myself and the applicant, and then as well with myself and the appellant. Um, the information was transferred between both parties, and uh, it was the understanding that they had no more concerns, the appellant, excuse me, had no more concerns. Um, however, when I reached out to the appellant um, to bring this amendment forward, I did not hear anything back. Okay, thank you. Someone needs to be muted, maybe. Um, we're hearing quite a bit of background noise. Um, any uh, further questions or comments on this matter? So seeing none, I have both a resolution and a bylaw for our consideration council. Uh, the first, uh, the resolution reads as follows, that the council of the municipality of North Perth approved the application for a zoning bylaw amendment affecting property described as part of lot 30 concession one part lot 16 plan 430 elma ward in the municipality of north perth mitchell road south the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement conforms to the policies of the county of, Fer of perth official plan and meets the provisions of the north perth zoning bylaw can i call on councillor johnston to be our mover for this one yes i would move that Thank you. And Councillor Richardson, would you serve as our seconder? I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion or debate? Anything for your thoughts? Okay, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up then is the bylaw to uh, go with this. It reads as follows, that bylaw number 91-2020, being a bylaw to amend the North Perth zoning bylaw number 6-ZB-1999 as amended, be introduced, read, and considered read a first, second, and third time, and be finally passed, and the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. And I call on Councillor Rothwell to be our mover for that one. Also move. Thank you. And Councillor Seiler, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion or debate, Council, on the bylaw? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. All right, so that brings us to 5.2.2. Uh, council is provided with a report from County of Perth Potter David Gundrum that recommends that this council advise County Council's Land Division Committee pertaining to a request from Witzel Dice Engineering on behalf of Lavalit Limited for a consent to sever in Kurtzville. Uh, yeah, we heard that one before, sorry. Um, I'll ask Mr. Gundrum to provide us with an overview of this request. Welcome, Mr. Gundrum. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Uh, Mayor, members of North Perth Council, uh, the following application for consent by Witzel Dice Engineering on behalf of Lavalit Limited uh, proposes to sever a new commercial industrial lot within the hamlet of Kurtzville in the Wallace Ward. Uh, the new lot would have approximately 88 metres or 288 feet of frontage along Perth Line 88 and would have an area lot area of approximately 1.3 hectares or 3.2 acres. Uh, the proposed severed lot is currently vacant and is intended to be developed in future to contain a new repair shop uh, that would service licensed trucks, trailers, and other heavy equipment. The proposed retained lot in this case would be a farm lot having 136 meters or 446 feet of frontage along Perth Line 88 and would have a lot area of approximately 114 hectares or 283 acres. Uh, the proposed retained lot contains farmland uh, two separate woodlots, a metal clad shed, as well as a barn, a ground based solar panel, and a water course uh, being a municipal drain. Uh, the proposed severed lot is within the settlement area uh, hamlet designation of the County of Perth official plan, 
while the proposed retained lot is within both the agriculture uh, and the natural resource environment designations of the County of Perth official plan. Application B3320 would result in the creation of a lot which has similar frontage, depth, and lot size as per neighboring lots within the hamlet of Kurtzville that currently contain existing commercial industrial uses. Uh, the lot proposed to be created would be bounded to the north and the east by the existing settlement area boundaries uh, for the hamlet. As the subject lands are currently within the future development zone of the North Perth Zoning Bylaw, which does not permit the intended use, an application for zoning bylaw amendment would have to be made to the municipality of North Perth in order to permit the proposed use. A recommended condition of consent has been included to direct that the subject lands being the sever proposed severed lot be placed in an appropriate zone to permit the intended commercial industrial development should the application be approved. <clears throat> Uh, section uh, six uh, under new development of the County of Perth official plan describes that expansions of built up areas that are within existing boundaries of designated settlement areas uh, must be minor in nature and be limited to the rounding out or squaring off of the existing built up area. Uh, the proposed use is representative, representative of non-farm development uh, in the form of an industrial commercial use that would provide enhanced services for the surrounding rural area. As the, proposed, uh, as the proposal involves the creation of a single lot at the edge of a built up area, being within an existing designated settlement area, this can be considered minor in nature uh, and would result also in the squaring off of uh, that built up area. The location of the proposed lot and the intended use would also be consistent and compatible with existing commercial industrial development found in the immediate area and also found immediately adjacent to the west of the proposed severed lot. Uh, under section six, uh, commercial and industrial uses of the county official plan, uh, this section also contains a number of criteria that shall apply to commercial and, and industrial uses found within the Hamlet designation. In addressing these criteria, the size of the proposed severed lot has been found to be appropriate to the local setting, uh, being a very similar size and frontage uh, to nearby lots also containing commercial industrial uses. As per the provincial policy statement or PPS, the creation of a commercial industrial lot at the proposed location would result in a more efficient use of land and resources and also has potential to generate a greater range and mix of employment uses within an area having established commercial industrial uses to meet long-term employment needs by offering a more diverse choice of suitable sites for employment uses that are supportive of the needs of both existing and future local businesses. Uh, in conclusion, the proposed severance has been found to be consistent with the PPS and also to be in general conformity with the County of Perth official plan. Uh, the County Planning Office is recommending uh, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth uh, recommend to the County of Perth Land Division Committee that the application uh, B33-20 made by uh, Witzel Dice Engineering on behalf of Lavalet Limited uh, be approved uh, subject to the four conditions uh, detailed in our report to Council. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer questions that uh, Council may have on this application. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gundam. Uh, Council, any questions or first comments on this matter? Else anything? So, uh, with council's indulgence, uh, this is one of those long resolutions where we might get a little bit speedier uh, by stipulating the conditions. So I will read the resolution, but I'm going to keep it a little shorter than usual. Uh, that uh, for our consideration that the council of the municipality of North Perth receive the report entitled application for consent to sever number B33-20 by Witzel Dice Engineering Inc. on behalf of Lavalet Limited affecting lands described as part of lots 46. 47 and 48 concession five Wallace Ward municipality of North Perth 65 66 Perth line 88 Kurtzville dated September 14th 2020 for information and that council recommends that the county of Perth land division committee or its designate approve the application for consent to sever number B33-20 part of lots 46 47 and 48 concession five Wallace Ward municipality of North Perth 6566 Perth Line 88 Kurtzville subject to the four conditions stipulated in the report from the planner. And I call on Councillor Andreessen to be our mover for that. Uh, 
Yes, I'll make that motion, Mayor Thank Kaysenberg. You. Thank you, and Councilor Anstett, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you very much. Discussion or debate? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried, thank you. That brings us to item 5.2.3. Uh, council is provided with a report from County of Perth planner David Gundrum that recommends that this council advise County Council's Land Division Committee pertaining to a request from parties Rears on behalf of party Morton for a consent to sever in Kurtzville. Uh, again, call on Mr. Gundrum to provide us with an overview of this request. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Uh, the following up, um, Mayor, members of council, the following application for consent uh, file B36-20 uh, proposes to sever a parcel of land within the hamlet of Kurtzville, having an area of approximately 0.21 hectares or 0.52 acres, which would be used as a residential lot addition uh, to an existing uh, property located to the east of the subject property, uh, having a municipal address of 6681 Perth Line 88. Uh, the proposed severed parcel is vacant and intended to be added to the rear yard of the abutting lot. The resulting enlarged parcel in this case would have uh, a, an, un, an unchanged frontage of approximately 37 meters or 122 feet along Perth Line 88, uh, but would have a new lot depth of approximately 126 meters or 415 feet and a new lot area of approximately 0.41 hectares or 1.01 acres. The lot to which the severed parcel is to propose to be added to uh, currently has a lot area of 0.2 hectares or 0.49 acres. Uh, the proposed retained lot in this case uh, contains a single detached dwelling uh, with an accessory shed and would have an area of approximately 0.69 hectares or 1.7 acres uh, following severance should the severance be approved. Uh, as noted, the, the primary effect of the application would be to create a residential lot addition, which would in effect uh, cause an, a, a rear extension of an interior lot line along the west side of the lot uh, located at 6681 Perth Line 88, resulting in a deeper rear yard uh, that would have comparable length to the adjacent property uh, found at 6683 Perth Line 88. Under section six, uh, concerning lot enlargements of the County of Perth official plan. Uh, there are five criteria that the plan details must be satisfied for consents, which propose to enlarge existing lots within the Hamlet designation. Of particular concern to this application is criteria C, stating that the area uh, to be severed for lot enlargement purposes should be minimal in size and appropriate for the proposed use, as well as criteria D, which states that all lots involved in the consent application must be in conformity with the provisions of the local municipalities implementing zoning bylaw. Should the severance be approved, uh, the boundaries of the retained and enlarged lots would be reconfigured such that they would be more consistent with the general uh, lot pattern and, and also size of existing residential lots found in the immediate area, particularly along the south side of Perth Line 88. With regard to uh, section six, lot enlargement of the County of Perth official plan, the amount of land proposed to be severed uh, has been found to be both minimal in area as well as appropriate for the intended residential land use. Uh, under section 14 of the North Perth uh, zoning bylaw, uh, the bylaw requires a minimum lot area of 1,850 square meters or 20,000 square feet for single detached dwellings within the Hamlet Village residential zone. Uh, the proposed retained lot and the enlarged lot to the east would each meet this minimum requirement should the severance be approved. Uh, the existing lot at 6681 Perth Line 88 uh, currently does conform to this minimum requirement, uh, ignoring uh, the proposed enlargement. Under Section 1422 of the Zoning Bylaw, a uh, minimum lot frontage of 24 meters or 80 feet is required for single detached dwellings on interior lots. Both the retained lot and the enlarged lot would each meet would each uh, exceed this minimum requirement. As the lands proposed to be severed are within uh, the Hamlet Village Residential uh, Four zone of the local zoning bylaw, with the added uh, dash four provision to permit a furniture repair and refinishing establishment, uh, while the lands to be uh, severed 
are, are that which are proposed to be added to this uh, to the adjacent lot or within the HBR zone. Uh, without these added provisions, a recommended condition of consent has been included uh, to place uh, the severed parcel within the HVR zone uh, to ensure that the resultant lot conforms to local zoning for the intended use and that the application maintains uh, consistency with Section 6 of the County of Perth Official Plan. In summary, uh, the proposed severance has been found to be consistent with the provincial policy statement as well as uh, being in general conformity with the County of Perth Official Plan. Uh, county planning staff are recommending that uh, the Council of the Municipality of North Perth recommend to the County of Perth Land Division Committee uh, that application B36-20 uh, be approved uh, subject to the five conditions contained in our report. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that members of council have uh, concerning this application. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Gundrum. Council, any uh, questions or first comments on this? Anything, Clerk Burkholz? Okay. So seeing none, I have a, a resolution for our consideration that I will again abbreviate uh, just a touch. Uh, and for our consideration that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth receive the report entitled Application for Consent to Sever Number B36-20 by Melissa and Brian Greers on behalf of Catherine Morton, affecting lands described as Lot 26 RCP 458 Wallace Ward, Municipality of North Perth, 6683 Perth Line 88, Hertzville, dated September 14, 2024, information, and that Council recommends to the County of Perth Land Division Committee or its designate approve the application for consent to sever number B36-20, lot 26, RCP 458, Wallace Ward, Municipality of North Perth, 6683, Perth Line 88, Kurtzville, subject to the five conditions that have been listed in the planner's report. And I call on Councillor Behrens to be our mover for this. Yes, I will move that motion. Thank you. And Councillor Duncan, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I'll second that. Thank you. Any discussion or debate on that matter? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gundrum, for joining us tonight. Appreciate your patience. Yeah, thank you, Council. Have a good meeting, everybody. Thank you. For item 5.2.4, Council is provided with a report from Deputy Clerk Beer proposing the establishment of a highway. Of course, we're not actually putting a new highway on Cotton Street, but we're allowing the creation of a new road, sort of a housekeeping matter as an extension to the existing Hutton Street in the municipality. Um, I, I don't know if we need, would council like an explanation from the clerk's department about this matter, or is this acceptable that we just move ahead to this consideration? I think we're good. Okay, so we're gonna move ahead with this one. I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows. The Council of the Municipality of North Perth received the report entitled Establish Highway, extension of Hutton Street West dated September 14th, 2020 for information and further that bylaw number 129-2020, being a bylaw to establish a highway, be introduced, read, and considered read a first, second, and third time, and be finally passed. And said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Deputy Mayor Kellum, can I call on you to serve as our mover for that one? Yes, I'll make that motion. Thank you. And Councillor Johnston, will you serve as our seconder? Yes, I would gladly second that. Thank you. Any discussion or debate on this matter? Seeing none, let's have that vote. So that is carried, thank you. The imp and me wanted to point out that uh, highway in this context did not mean highway, or that would be quite a shock to the residents of, of Hutton Street. All right, that brings us to uh, <coughs> item 5.2.5. Uh, with some bated breath, Council is provided with a report further to its earlier requests related to changing current policy and practice with regards to backyard or urban hens. I will uh, ask perhaps at this point, uh, Clerk Bearfelds to uh, speak to the report that's been provided in our Council package. So let me set this up for you, Pat. 
The report before you, Council, is basically what was requested um, based on the delegations and inquiries that we've had over the past few months. So tonight what has been provided is uh, various types of um, information as well as the survey results that have been collected through the North Perth media um, as well as individuals that did choose to come in and fill one out um, via paper. Over and above all of this, I did have only one um, telephone conversation from a North Perth resident that chose not to fill out a form, but wanted me to express the concerns that she had in regards to, again, noise, um, not wanting to necessarily be living next to the chickens because of odor, noise, and uh, did not feel it was appropriate um, as a resident for North Perth. So just providing that, as I said to the individual that I would. Um, so tonight, Council, um, there is no recommendation. You've been in inundated with all kinds of information, whether it be from the delegation or all the attachments that we did provide for you. So I do not have a recommendation, um, but I'll turn it back over to the to the mayor as to how you'd like to proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, Clerk Perfelds. So uh, Council, um, let's talk this one through. Staff has of course moved through a considered process and, and acknowledged uh, to us that in this week's package, there was a lot to read and digest. Um, so there was sort of a gentle um, suggestion from staff that uh, we uh, wait a week so that we have the opportunity to digest what was uh, in this report. Um, however, uh, while it is for our consideration to defer further action for a week, uh, we could choose an alternate approach and get a decision tonight on what the next steps are, if any pertaining to this matter. Should we have general favorability towards creating a more permissive policy, we would, as noted, need to hold a public meeting for a zoning bylaw amendment and prepare a bylaw, which is more permissive towards urban chickens. There's a couple of places in bylaws where things will have to be adjusted. So my thought was that I would test to some degree council's willingness to defer versus proceeding to consider this matter tonight. Be aware that our forecast for next meeting is that it too will be quite long with its uh, agenda so far as, as we see it. So I invite thoughts from council first on, on whether we uh, accept a deferral for a week or whether we um, put a motion on the floor this week to get on with this business. Anyone wish to speak? Councillor Barons, would you like to go first? Um, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. I don't necessarily believe that our next step is to move to a public meeting. Um, I think the time for having a small flock, um, irregardless of whether we're talking laying hens or uh, raising birds for meat, is winding to an end since overwintering is a sincere consideration and concern. I believe that we've got plenty of time to do a little bit more research and digest um, this matter if council does deem it to move forward um, in developing a bylaw. Um, perhaps our only consideration tonight is do we need, do we um, as a council wish to move forward to develop a bylaw or not, but we certainly um, need to take some time. There are so many aspects of this that we need to consider. Oh, Councillor Behrens, we lost your feed. She may be in a low bandwidth situation temporarily, it looks like. Okay, we may come back to Councillor Behrens. Councillor Rothwell is next. Thank you, uh, Mayor Todd. And if uh, Julie comes back, I'll uh, certainly uh, defer to her, but... Uh... Uh, I agree with the comments that uh, Councillor Behrens uh, raised. I think we do have time to uh, uh, consider this matter. I, I would point out two things. One, I recall in our conversations previously about uh, the, the need to uh, have uh, comments from uh, here on Perth Public Health on this issue. They had uh, provided comments in the previous uh, uh, considerations uh, around the county, and I think it's very important that we have uh, our uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, comments on this issue. Uh, secondly, I'm just uh, concerned that uh, uh, 
Clerk Derfeld's report uh, simply mentions zoning bylaw amendment. And again, just being a stickler, we had talked about uh, having comments uh, here in terms of about whether or not an official plan amendment is required because it is a change of policy uh, allowing for uh, uh, urban hens in areas in the residential designation, which specifically excludes uh, uh, keeping and raising of uh, livestock. So I would just... Uh, I concur with uh, what Councillor Behrens had said before she was cut off, uh, that I believe that we do have time to deal with this, uh, knowing and understanding that uh, uh, at least two uh, flocks that we're aware of had to be re relocated to comply with the provisions of the bylaw. Uh, but uh, it may address the overwintering -win issue uh, so that we do have enough time to uh, spend moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk Behrens, do we have anyone else? Huh? Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg, and um, yes, just to reiterate what Julie said, even though I'm a, uh, obviously, you can see that I'm a proponent of this, but I do believe that we have time because the wintering of birds came, um, or will be here, unfortunately, before we know it, <laughs> given how cold it's been in the last couple of days. However, there's been an absolute inordinate amount of information that has been provided to us. Um, I was just wondering if the staff could also come back in conjunction with the uh, coming back to find out do we need to go to a public meeting of which we will at some point I understand that but in the interim after the fact if we initiate a pilot project how does initiating a pilot project like so many other municipalities have done prior to a bylaw amendment um, and zoning and going to uh, OP official plan amendment and to do that and could something like this in the future, if deemed appropriate by council, fall under a temporary use bylaw, uh, possibly in conjunction with a pilot? I would like uh, possibly, I don't, because it's in relation to this report, I don't think that needs to come under a separate request. I'm not sure. Uh, like in the section 10, it is believed for reports. <laughs> but I'm just wondering like how an actual pilot works with the uh, municipal act as far as putting that information in. Uh, there's lots of information to go through, um, and obviously we know from reading all of the comments that have come forward from the chickens that there, there's a lot of chickens out there right now. Um, so we need to keep that in mind, but there is also a lot of information that we need to um, keep in mind. Uh, just, I didn't make mention of it when I was speaking to Al. I did, um, out of my own time today uh, reach out to the uh, Poultry Industry Council uh, today just for a conversation to say for doing due diligence not on behalf of council by any means but of my own personal behalf to find out that Al was I mean, um, intimately involved with Georgina and I will provide this information to Mr. Yilmaz and Pat tomorrow like some of the rules and regulations how they've formulated, I would much rather be cautious and allow something to go forward than allow a free-for-all. Even though I'm for it, I don't want a free-for-all and just birds everywhere. Not that it would be, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I do believe that the, we can certainly go about this in a controlled manner, um, but I will provide that information and the copies of their bylaws and the information that they've given to their residents. I will provide that uh, tomorrow via email, and if Council is interested, I can copy everyone on it just for for direction and how they're going about their pilot of which they have very similar to zoning bylaws to what they have. So that's what prompted asking about whether they could do it as a pilot without doing the bylaw amendment first. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't know if we can get any immediate feedback on the how you structure a, a pilot. Do you need to change the bylaw or bylaws, plural actually, um, to conduct a pilot or, or not? Um, but uh, perhaps that, that is best left to uh, further exploration if, uh, if that's what Council's wish is. Uh, anyone else wish to speak on this matter? Uh, Councillor Anstett? Thanks, Mayor Kaysenberg, through you and all great comments from all the other councillors as well. And I think where I'm coming from, at least, the information that we received from Al in his package and also his presentation tonight, it's, it's truly information overload. Um, in looking at it, it's been certainly helpful I think, though, that as Councillor Rothwell, Councillor Behrens, and Councillor Richardson have all said, I think we need to just take a minute, review it. And the one thing that I want to look at, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is what other municipalities have done. I want to see some benchmarks on what their pilot programs have looked like, what their bylaws look like, um, how is the program working. I think all that information is going to be really helpful for us going forward and making this decision. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I've received a note suggesting that Councillor Kearns is having some difficulty uh, rejoining our council meeting, uh, which is unfortunate. Hopefully, uh, um, if our IT person is listening, there's uh, some support that may be needed. Um, anyone else wish to speak at this time? Any other comments? Councillor Richardson? Oh, thank you again. All I was saying is about the pilot project, what I had made reference to in my previous statement. I wasn't expecting that this evening, and that's why I'd be uh, in favor of uh, going for a deferral of this for two weeks in order to try and glean some of that information. I wasn't expecting that this evening by any means, um, just for clarification. Okay. Anyone further? Okay. So it, it appears that... Uh, um, so far from the comments made, there's some support, at least for most of the resolution that uh, the uh, staff has put before us, uh, although perhaps we need to tweak the, uh, the date, the timing of the return report, especially given some of the scope that's been presented uh, as suggested um, additional information the council would like to see for this. Um, so I I'm going to put this resolution on the floor here and, and we'll see where it goes. Um, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth received the Urban Chickens in North Perth report dated September 14th, 2020 for information and that uh, it further it de defer a decision on directions until the September 21st, 2020 Council meeting. So that's next week. Um, I think the clerk is saying that's not possible. Um, so why don't we say the first meeting in October as a more realistic, uh, given that there's a request for um, collecting data about other uh, current pilots and legal opinions and MOH opinion and so forth. So the first meeting of October is the suggested um, date for this matter. Um, uh, can I call on, let's see here, Councillor uh, Richardson, will you move that motion? I will move that, thank you. Okay, and Councillor Rothwell, will you second that? I'll second the motion. All right, thank you. Discussion or debate? Anyone, Clerk Bear Phillips? I do find myself uh, sort of puzzled about how to proceed here. I will admit that um, I think that, that uh, there's ample information for us to make this decision. Uh, but I also understand Council's uh, requests and feeling that there's still some information gaps. Um, I, we won't stand in the way of, of uh, deferring this a little bit, but uh, I do advise that I think that the community is very interested in us resolving this in due course and the notion of, of waiting through the winter, uh, which wasn't said, but could be implied from some of the comments of other councillors um, that we have time. I'm not convinced now that we've uh, stuck the stick in this hornet's nest that we do have uh, a long period of time without the, the, the community becoming quite divided on this matter. So um, I, I'm, I, I will just urge council to consider uh, making a decision on this sooner rather than later. Anyone further? Okay, let's have that vote. Yeah, I need to see what's going on. Councillors, we're not recording a lot of votes here at this point. We know that two are, are abstaining for pecuniary interest. Uh, Councillor Seiler, what say you? Oh, they're coming in now. Okay. So we're waiting on Councillor Barron's. Councillor Barons, are you with us yet or no? I 
Councillor Rothwell. Motion in favor. Okay, so Councillor Rothwell's in favor. Councillor Burns, are you with us? Okay. Do we have to mark that she's left the meeting? Yes, we'll mark her absent for this vote. All right, so that is carried. Okay, so we need to see this again at the first meeting of October, which is what date? The 5th of October. This will come back to council. Thank you. Uh, let's go to item uh, 5.2.6. Sorry, I'll get my paper straight here. Council is asked to appoint a roster of interested citizens and councillors to the ad hoc Atwood, Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Advisory Group. I'll ask uh, North Perth Clerk Pat Bearfels to provide us with an overview on this one. Let me just get my things straight here. As uh, per my report, um, Council in March did uh, adopt a resolution to move forward with the mandate as well as uh, establishing an Atwood Cenotaph Restoration and Advisory Group as a Committee of Council. Um, recreation staff did reach out to individuals in the village of Atwood and the slate of uh, individuals willing to sit on this uh, advisory group is uh, stated in your report. And the, uh, the resolution tonight before you is to appoint those individuals um, to be part of the Atwood Cenotaph Register, Register, Restoration Advisory Group and that um, Amy and her staff can approach them um, as soon as possible to start working forward with the project. Uh, thank you, Clerk Bearfelds. Any questions or comments about this matter at this point based on the report? Else, anyone? Okay, so I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth appoints the following individuals to be part of the Atwood Cenotaph Restoration Advisory Group Susan Bonechanksker, Bill Bonechanksker, Karen Smith, Linda Robertson, Councillor Alan Rothwell, Councillor Matt Duncan, Amy Gangle, Interim Manager of Recreation, and Steve Wolf, Facility Supervisor. Can I call on Councillor Seiler to be our mover for this one? I will move it. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Andreessen, will you be our seconder for this one? Yes, I'll second that motion. Thank you very much. Any discussion or debate? Let's have that vote. Are we missing one? We know that Councillor Barons is having trouble and is absent. Are we missing someone else? Councilor I'm in favor. Okay, thank you. And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up is item 5.3. We have no indication of board from four council from our recreation department tonight. That turns us to item 5.4, reports from the treasury and finance department. As item 5.4.1, a finance staff has brought forward for council review, uh, the accounts as of September 14th, 2020. I'll note that uh, Councillor Kellum, Deputy Mayor Kellum, and uh, Councillor Barons, who's absent from what we can tell because of uh, internet connection problems, uh, had declared potential pecuniary interests in this item and therefore are absenting themselves from consideration. Are there any questions from council to staff about the report that is in our and the package. Seeing none, I have a resolution that reads as follows. Suffering, follow, ugh, I'll find my words. That the following summary of accounts be received by council for information. The total is $1,675,157.44. Can I call on Councillor Anstead to be our mover for this one? Yes, I'll move that. 
Thank you. And Councillor Duncan, will you serve as our seconder? I will second that. Great. Thank you. Any discussion or debate on the financial report? Seeing no indication of that, let's have that vote. And that is carried. Thank you. Uh, next up is item 5.4.2. Council is presented with a report prepared by the Finance Department proposing consideration of a bylaw to amend a previous funding bylaw pertaining to the Cleveland Municipal Drain. I believe Ms. Hale is with us, and uh, I guess she's going to address this item. Ms. Hale. Thank you very much, Mayor Kaysenberg, members of Council. Uh, the Cleveland Drain construction uh, is complete, and at this point we're ready to uh, build this to the benefiting uh, property owners in the road departments, and tonight is the bylaw uh, to finalize that for Council consideration. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to see that the uh, drains came in under budget. Uh, so I guess that's a, a nice new story for us. And any questions or comments from council on this matter before we consider the resolution? Seeing none, uh, I have a resolution for our consideration that reads as follows that bylaw 124-2020 to amend bylaw 41-2018 for the construction of the Cleveland municipal drain be read and considered read a first, second, and third time and be finally passed. And that the site said bylaw signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Can, is Councillor Behrens with us or no? Okay. Uh, can I call on the Deputy Mayor Kellum to be our mover for this one? I will make that motion. Thank you. And Councillor Johnston, would you serve as our second? Yes, I would second that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, any discussion or debate, Council? Let's have that vote. And that is carried. Okay, next up then is item 5.4.3. Uh, this is an, a report from the Treasury uh, and Finance Department pertaining to possible considerations for relief of municipal fees or taxes for ratepayers with incomes or cash flows affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is further to a request by Council for consideration of possible actions. Again, we'll call <laughs> our Director of Finance Treasurer to address this item, Ms. Hale. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg. Um, as, as you mentioned, um, on August the 17th, Council requested that uh, staff do further review with regard to uh, what other municipalities have been able to do uh, for their property owners. Uh, since then, staff have um, continued to involve themselves with uh, the Municipal Finance Officers Association and um, the uh, on, um, Association for Municipalities of Ontario uh, just to gleam as much as possible what uh, is being out, done out there to help uh, businesses and residents uh, in municipalities by the municipal governments. And um, we have seen where there are some or two that we're aware of anyway, Ottawa and Clarington, where they have uh, provided um, a program um, that provides residents only with uh, the ability to make application for uh, a rebate. Um, as was indicated by the staff through the Municipal Finance Officers Association, candid discussions was that the effort involved and uh, those that did actually um, were able to have any uh, assistance was very minimal and that it was felt that the effort and the cost <coughs> to create the program was um, more significant than the help that was provided for the residents. Um, as you know, we have had a request from a business for a rebate as well. And uh, as that has been noted that under the Municipal Act, uh, Section 106, that uh, it crosses that line into um, being prohibitive for 
the consideration that it, it's um, uh, assisting uh, unfairly one business over another and therefore um, it, it's considered to be a no-no. Um, council though did leave me uh, with the idea on the 17th that uh, there was a, a desire to make some effort uh, in sort of a, an overall uh, approach to our residents to try to ease the adverse effects of the pandemic and um, I have to thank uh, Becky she uh, Balfour she had uh, been listening to the uh, Municipal Finance Officers Association input and one of them was not to actually do away with or waiver uh, the penalty on taxes totally but actually to reduce it um, to whatever council felt was appropriate um, at one and a quarter percent per month right now which is the maximum we can charge and most municipalities do that that equates to 15 percent per annum and uh, given the interest rates that are currently um, um, available right now um, that seems very extreme and so council might want to consider um, reducing our ta property tax uh, penalty and interest rate uh, for a period of time or indefinitely until they look at this again um, once we see uh, where the, what the future holds for our community. And um, therefore, uh, tonight I, I would propose that uh, Council consider a reduction in the tax, property tax uh, penalty and interest, uh, but um, that they confirm that they are unable to provide um, a tax rebate for or exemption to uh, businesses at this time. Now, the one thing that council might still want to consider is the deferral, but um, as I have noted in my report, uh, those municipalities that have done that have uh, also found that their cash flow is very much disrupted, and some of their ratepayers are very unhappy because they had wanted to continue to pay, and yet there was no billing or um, um, automatic withdrawal or or the ability to pay on account. So um, I think from that perspective, I don't think the deferral is uh, as fruitful possibly as just not charging the penalty because in either case, it's still going to be due and payable. And therefore, I'll leave you with uh, those thoughts for consideration this evening. Thanks, Ms. Hale. Um, questions and first comments from councillors on this matter? Councillor Johnston. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor Todd, and thanks, Fran, for all your comments and your work on this. And uh, I, ag I agree that I'm not in favour of the deferral. Um, I think it just piles the taxes up for for people that do have the ability to pay. Uh, what I am uh, what I am in favour of is is changing the uh, the interest, uh, the penalty be reduced, uh, and and I I would propose for for conversation out there to reduce it from 1.25 percent down to 0.5 percent per month, uh, and I and I like it being left open ended uh, until until further council consideration. Uh, that lets us revisit it when we see um, that things have turned around, and then we can uh, we can end it if that's appropriate at that time. Just my comments for now. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, other comments or questions at this point? Okay, so um, you know, if if we do if we do 0.25 percent per month, that's a three percent interest rate. Uh, Ms. Hale, what 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 is the implication of that? Do you have a quick off the top of your head response to that? Three percent, six percent. Certainly, we would be uh, experiencing a reduction in our revenues, but uh, we have experienced that um, uh, to date for the period that we did from March the 24th to um, um, the end of July. Uh, I do feel that uh, 
the province has provided us with some funding and that certainly um, uh, as we move forward with some of our costs and adding it up together will include this as part of that cost. Uh, but we do feel that the province has provided us with uh, some support that enables us to, um, to then in turn supply some support to uh, our ratepayers. Okay, so, so far we've heard uh, uh, from Councillor Johnson 0.5%. You've heard from me 0.25%. Maybe we should split the difference. Maybe it's 0.375%, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, Councillor Richardson. Uh, thank you, Mary Kaysenberg. I also agree with uh, Councillor Johnson that we need to, it, and even the report, thank you, Fran, for that, that the 0.5 or the 0.25, I'd be okay with that. We. We are in totally uncertain times. We have received a little bit of funding. Um, and right now, even though I'm incredibly concerned about, um, not concerned, but overall concerned about revenues that we have, if we need to defer it for the sake of a few months, I'm fine with that. But it also makes a good point, uh, as Councillor Johnson had made mention of, to possibly leave it open-ended, um, only for the reason we don't want to say until the end of December and then find out that we're, heaven forbid, second wave rears its head and we're still back and we're constantly bringing stuff back um, until further deliberation occurs and things have uh, straightened out a little bit but uh, I'd be willing to go ahead with either the 0.5 or the 0.25 percent we need to make it as less or at least impactful as uh, quite possible that we can do thank you Thanks. Anyone else uh, on this list to uh, have at this point? Okay. Dave, would you split me the difference and we go with 0.375%? Uh, I'd be fine with that. I have no issues with that at all. Okay. Well, we, the two of us are the ones talking numbers so far. Um, okay. Well, we have a resolution for consideration. We'll, we'll pop that number in and see what happens. Uh, that the Council of the Municipality of North Perth will not be providing property tax exemptions and recommend that individuals and business look to the federal and provincial government programs for financial assistance. And further, that the penalty and interest charge on property tax from 1.25% to 0.375% per month from September 15th, 2020 until further council consideration. Uh, let's see here, where are we at? Uh, Councillor Richardson, would you... Uh, serve as our mover for that. I'd be happy to move that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rothwell, would you serve as our seconder? I'll second the motion. Very good. Discussion or debate? Councillor Johnston. Sorry, just a quick question to Fran. Because that's a bit of an odd number, that's not an issue uh, with the computer program that we'll be doing it with, is it? We can work with it and um, appreciate your consideration. Okay. Any other comments, discussion, debate? All right, let's have that vote. And that's carried, thank you. Now, let's see, we, that brings us, moves us along. We have no reports from our manager of environmental services from his department tonight for this meeting. That moves us to item 5.6 and specifically item 5.6.1. Uh, as item 5.6.1, council is asked to award the tender for snow removal, salting and sanding for the coming winter season to Hannah and Hamilton construction I'll invite Mr. Lyndon Couch, our Manager of Operations, to address this matter. Welcome, Mr. Couch. Thank you, Mayor Kaysenberg, members of Council. Uh, the uh, Finance and Purchasing Assistant has put together a recommendation based on the low and only bid uh, for winter plowing, and this is mainly winter plowing with single axle trucks in urban areas, including Listowel, and also uh, some of the Atwood area, um, depending on the routing that'll be changed this winter. Um, the rates have uh, gone up significantly in the last few years due to insurance payments that companies are having to make. Uh, it's reflected in the $150 per hour and per standby day uh, that 
bring about these totals in front of you. So in year one, it's 85,000 and 87 and 92,000. Um, we're looking at the modernization uh, reporting with the county, just for council's information in terms of what could change in terms of routing and efficiencies uh, with shared services, as well as with the change in services that we could provide. None of that will be in front of us for this winter. Uh, that's why this tender went out. And really this is just to bring back the same amount of uh, contractors as we've had in the past. And that's what's reflected in front of you. If we find efficiencies that can be uh, realized in the, ne in the next couple of years, uh, what we'll do is uh, opt out of year two or year three or make changes to that with the existing contractors that we do have available to us. So in front of you is the recommendation to award to the low and only bid, and that is Hannah and Hamilton Construction here in Listwell. Thanks, Mr. Couch. Uh, just remind me uh, what, uh, what this number for 2020-2021 looks like versus 2019-2020. We've had actual pricing, the budget's in front of you at 100,000, but the actual prices that have come in typically were around the 50 to $70,000 worth of work, depending on the amount of hours that were actually spent versus standby days. And it completely relates to the amount of winter that we get in a given winter. Uh, so these these budget items are again, that uh, the difference between about $120 an hour to 150 might be 15 to 20% uh, or 15% higher than previous years. And it is common. Are we seeing, I, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but you've checked with our neighbors and they too are seeing this sort of uh, very low a number of bidders or in our case, a single bidder in these kind of competitions these days? Yes, absolutely. Of our uh, neighboring municipalities, uh, they're struggling to find contractors that will fulfill the plowing operations that they've had in the past. Um, others have uh, retained the same contractors just as we're trying to do here. Okay, very good. Council, any other questions or comments? Nothing there. Okay, so let's uh, consider a resolution that's uh, been placed before us here that the Council of the Municipality of Perth award the tender number NP 008 20T winter plowing, salting, and sanding to Hannah and Hamilton construction in the amount of $85,050 for the coming season up to the tender total of $264,870 HST excluded. And I call on Councillor Sider to be our mover for that one. Yes, I'll move that. Thank you. And Councillor Andreessen, will you serve as our seconder? Councillor Andreessen. Councillor Andreessen. Yes, I can second that motion. Sorry, Thank my you. tech not working. Well, there we go. It's the night. All right, any discussion or debate on this matter? Seeing none, let's have that vote. And that is carried, thank you. Um, we have no indication of reports. Uh, thanks, Lyndon. Uh, we have no indication of reports from our manager of, uh, of uh, uh, Fire Chief. Sorry, I've been going down to Fire Chief here. We have no indication of reports from Fire Chief. That brings us to agenda item number six. For item 6.1, councillors, are there any reports you would like to ask of staff or our committees? Again, to uh, request the opportunity to speak uh, present yourself through the chat window at Fairfields. Councillor Rothwell. That was actually for a, a question I had on the last resolution. I was concerned about the fact that it only talked about for the upcoming season as opposed to years one, two, and three. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, I do have a question for... Uh, uh, report and perhaps we're going to hear this further from uh, you, uh, Mayor Todd. When we're anticipating return to in-person council meeting? So um, I don't think that uh, we will move to an in-person council meeting um, without a sort of hybrid option. 
which would allow uh, some members of council to uh, dial in. And uh, one of the matters that, that we believe we understand from Dr. Claussen's instructions is that an in-person council meeting with public exposure would require any councillor in physical attendance to wear a mask the whole time. Um, I'm, you know, reluctant to impose uh, necessar unnecessarily that when the technology has uh, has been available to us and is is working. So I know that there are um, increasing pressures from individuals uh, who and in our community who are asking that question. But uh, um, regardless of how we do, we will have to look at a, a hybrid approach. I think moving forward to respect. Uh, uh, that we can to one and two that uh, uh, there are some who will find wearing a mask uh, um, a challenge in, in this environment. Thank you. The reports to, of staff or committees at this point. Okay, for item seven, we've received no items of correspondence beyond that that has already been shared. Under our consent agenda for council's disposition, that brings us to item eight on our agenda, which allows council to consider enact bylaws. We've done a number of bylaws in their appropriate sections in the agenda tonight, so we have no additional bylaw proposals before us. Uh, that brings us to agenda item nine. Uh, are there any notices of motion from councillors attending this evening? Sir, Graf, anything? Okay. Uh, that brings us to agenda item number 10. For item 10.1, are there any announcements that would be of benefit to our community or that reflect well on North Perth at this time? Again, if you'd like to speak, indicate so to the clerk through the chat box. Councillor Johnston. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And I will uh, put on my uh, budget chair hat right now and uh, say to everyone out there in the public, um, uh, if they wish to fill in a budget survey, the uh, Your Say North Perth uh, budget survey is open. And I believe last year we had 140 some responses or surveys filled out. And this year I'm hoping with the boys from Britain in charge, we can get well over the 200 responses um, on the Your Say North Perth. And my second announcement is to council uh, that you would have received an email from Jessica about a um, survey to fill in from council to, for our upcoming visioning session for the budget. And as of this afternoon, uh, none of you have filled it out. So please, we would like it by Friday. Uh, it would help guide us on our visioning session that is coming up in early October. So council by Friday, if everyone could fill out that uh, uh, follow the link that Jessica sent you on your nor your uh, your say North Perth, and please fill out the council survey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, uh, it, it must be done. All councillors need to uh, participate in the uh, that uh, pre uh, visioning survey. Uh, any other announcements, Councillor Rothwell? Thanks, Mayor Todd, as the other half of the voice from Britain, as uh, Councillor Johnson mentioned. But uh, mine specifically is dealing with uh, the good news story of that the uh, GGG uh, rail trail, the Godrich to Guelph, is uh, actually open uh, end to end, uh, save and accept a couple of deviations. But there was great work by the uh, Project uh, Red crew, and that was based on uh, funding not only from the province of Ontario, uh, which I believe Council and the public were aware of uh, previously, uh, but also uh, from donations from members of the public as well. Two weeks ago, my wife and I uh, enjoyed a bicycle ride uh, uh, from Moncton uh, east through to Milberton and return. Uh, and we saw all kinds of uh, people using the trail through uh, walking, uh, whether with strollers or on their own, uh, uh, people on bicycles, as well as even a young lady uh, riding a horse, all of which are uh, permitted on the G2G trail. I think it's an excellent uh, opportunity for members of the public to take advantage of uh, these opportunities. The trails are uh, nice and smooth. Uh, they've uh, been uh, uh, supported uh, through uh, the Project Red crew who've done a great job and uh, the overall uh, G2G uh, working group uh, that's done uh, guidance and direction. So uh, the uh, hats off to, to them for that uh, excellent work. Uh, and also I must say, uh, 
Uh, Nancy and I have also uh, done the full uh, uh, trail from Line 87 through to Henprin on the North Perth Trail. And hats off uh, also to our North Perth staff on Parks and Rec in particular and Public Works that have uh, done a great job to uh, keep that uh, trail in great shape. And both of these trails offer an opportunity for our members of the public to uh, get exercise in a COVID-friendly uh, way and environment. Uh, there is signage up on the, the trails to make sure that people are uh, enjoying them responsibly. And again, thank you very much to uh, both the GGG uh, uh, trail uh, group and the Project Red team and certainly our North Perth staff on the North Perth Trail. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Yes, very exciting news. Okay, so the clerk is saying no further uh, indications of uh, request to speak. And that brings us to agenda item number 11. We have no matters for consideration in a closed session meeting of council tonight. That means for agenda item number 12, we have nothing to report for a closed session that didn't happen. Council has mandated a good practice acts near the end of its meeting agenda to confirm all of its actions and business of its meeting through what is called the confirmatory bylaw. I have a draft for that for consideration that reads as follows. It's bylaw number 130-2020, being a bylaw to confirm generally previous actions of the Council of the Municipality of North Perth be introduced, read and considered read a first, second and third time and be finally passed. And that the said bylaw be signed by the mayor and the clerk and sealed with the seal of the corporation. Can I call on Councillor Anstead to be our mover for that one? Yes, I will move that. Thank you, and Councillor Barons, glad to have you back. Uh, will you second that? I can't because I have to declare oh. conflict. My bad, thank you. Uh, so that's uh, down to Deputy Mayor Kellum. Will you second that? Same here. Same, same, oh my gosh. It's late, I'm losing it. Uh, Councillor Johnston, you're up. Uh, I'm in the same boat. I declared a conflict on one so, of the public meetings. So he's out. I'll too, second so. it. I'll second it. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Matt. It's late. All right. Um, any discussion or debate? Let's have that vote. The few who can, the few the proud. There's our crew, that's a, that's a carry. Thank you. And uh, so we have completed our deliberations and taken action on the business that did come before us tonight. Before I read a motion to adjourn, is there any further business? Seeing none, uh, I have a resolution that reads as follows, that the council meeting adjourns at 10.15 p.m. to meet again for general council business on Monday, September 21st, 2020. 7 p.m. Uh, let's try Councillor Burns for that one. Yes, I will move that motion. Well done, Mayor. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Duncan, will you second that? I'll second that. All right. Let's have that vote. Not debatable. And that is carried. We are adjourned until September 21st. Thanks all. Have a good night.